board members are there right now, right? Thank you. Great, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight is April 20th and we do have a quorum, so I will call this meeting to order. Because this board meeting is being done virtually, all will be a roll call. On our call tonight, we have all seven board members present in addition to Superintendent Schultz. Superintendent Schultz, could you please introduce the members of the administration we have on the call tonight? Yes, we have uh, Carolyn Linden from Teaching and Learning. Uh, we have, um, uh, excuse me. Uh, we have John Tope, Director of Business Services. We have Leah Bird from Early Learning Center. Uh, Mark Carlson from Math Department. Mark DeYoung, uh, Assistant Principal at Concord. Mary Whitey, Director of Communications. Michael Walker, uh, the um, in Technology Integration Specialist at the Secondary. Randy Smazel, Director of Teaching and Learning. We have Sarah Shandle here, uh, Assistant to the Board. Sean Beaverson, uh, Technology Integration Specialist at the Elementary. Steve Butner in um, District Media and Technology Services. Tim Anderson from Southview, Principal at Southview Middle School. Troy Stein, Director of Athletics. Uli Rodriguez from uh, Multi-Language uh, uh, Department. Val Burke from uh, Community Ed and Zach Horn, our technician tonight. Did I miss anybody, staff? Okay. Great. Um, I wanted to let um, individuals know that we had to remove the American Indian presentation from the agenda due to a staff in, uh, member illness, so that won't be on the agenda tonight. Um, but John, would you like to review the rest of our agenda? Yes. So you, I'll start out tonight with approval of minutes. Uh, we have a recognition for Na National Board Certified Teacher, Lindsay McDermott. Um, we're going to recognize the state boys swim and, D swim and dive team champions. Um, we're going to um, have uh, excellence in action, uh, a new feature for our board meetings, and we're going to be recognizing uh, our volunteers tonight. Um, we have um, consent agenda. We have the reports and presentations in response to uh, COVID-19 and how we've responded to uh, providing distance learning uh, and, and responded to this crisis. We'll give some data and some um, information on how we are doing, and I think we're doing great. And then in discussion, we have the um, um, mission and value statement. We also have the um, discussion on changing the HR committee to governance. We have a policy review, and then we have legislative advocacy uh, during this current pandemic situation. Uh, under action, we have a uh, turf replacement. Uh, we will talk, have you approve the class size memo, and, um, and then your board reports thereafter. Great, thank you. Um, I just want to let the board members know that because we have so many people um, on the meeting virtually tonight, I actually can't see most of your faces. Um, so um, it's going to be difficult for me to know if you want to talk or not. And so I just wanted to let you guys know that before I move on. Um, I'm now going to move on to approving the minutes of our last few meetings. Do I have a motion to approve the March and April special meeting minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, well, now can I, can I, I have to wait, approve. Uh, excuse me. I, I'm sorry. I was trying to say something. Um, I have to, a request for two changes to the minutes. Okay. Um, so we have a motion to approve the meeting minutes on right now. So people, if they want to make changes to the meeting minutes, will have to vote this motion down. And then we will have to I'm sorry, I, I want to tell everybody that I did inform John and 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 um, board chair Allenberg that I was intending on doing this and I and I asked for them to send out uh, my requested changes to everybody's email and um, I did that I, since we didn't get it before the meeting started I sent it out just now so um, I don't know how else I could have done this.
So you you have a motion on the right to approve the meeting minutes. Approve the meeting minutes. Yeah. Do you have a discussion with that motion? What? Do you have a discussion with that motion? No, probably. Okay. Yeah. So, so I don't. I. I, yeah. I so I, minutes are subject to discussion, I believe. Okay. Okay. It, but it's a matter of. It, I mean, I I would need to know what the change is before I would vote to make a change. Right. So Ellen, that, when, Ellen, when look, it, look in look in your inbox for all the board members. I don't think we can do that. <laughs> Ellen, did when did well, I, I just what did you send those to me yesterday or today or today? today. Oh, okay. I don't think. Um, so it, or, we can't have board members look at that unless we provide this to the public. Well, if I read them to the public, or I could actually. That, um, I think that's fine with the discussion in, in discussion. Okay. okay. So um, for in for the discussion, um, I'm asking to correct the minutes for March 23rd, um, and I've added just a few words, um, and you could all check um, on YouTube, anybody who's listening to this, um, at one hour, 35 minutes, and 35 seconds, Member Michelson and Allen Berger, Berg commented, um, so I would like to add to the sentence that reads, Policy 104 complaints, um, the uh, policy reads, um, Jones requested, and I want to add, and the board agreed to take this to the community, uh, the policy committee for review, to review the policy. So I just want to add, and the board agreed to take this to, to that, those meeting minutes, because otherwise it looks as if I just requested it and it's not going to be done. So I don't have the ability to sit here right now and go back to look at that time frame to know if that's accurate. I, I it would be a lot more helpful to get this a couple of days in advance. So I know, I know. I can't I cannot agree to the change at this point. Well, I'm wondering if maybe somebody else remembers that, but that is what was on um, and it is on the YouTube tape, so um, maybe other people remember the, um, I know Owen said, yes, I'll take it back. Um, I agree that we should take this back for review. I remember talking about it. Does this change materially anything that's happening? Well, I just want to make sure 104 is reviewed. It's a, it's a policy and... Um, we because know that it's in the policy committee right now. Oh, well, and then so you're going to be reviewing it. And we'll talk about it briefly tonight. OK. Um, so that was one. And I just think that that I wanted to make sure that that got done. And then the other one um, was <coughs> reflected in uh, the April 16 um, meeting minutes. And it was with respect to the time study. And um, I would be adding a couple words to the notes on that. Um, the sentence reads, Brian Bass presented the requested time study report. The board reaffirmed its commitment to the middle school model. And I would add after that, barring financial considerations from the current economic climate to that sentence. So the sentence, the new sentence would read, the board reaffirmed its commitment to the middle school model, barring financial considerations from the current econo economic climate. And the people that had commented on that at our last meeting were myself, Owen, Lenny, and Matt Fox. So all of us said something about the need to make sure that um, uh, uh, the middle school model is financially feasible. So I I wouldn't put that in as an all board reaffirmation though, or, or an uh, all board comment. Although it was the majority. Well, actually, what I my view on it was barring financial considerations. Period, irrespective of the source. But yes, that is consistent with comments by some of us, or at least part of it is consistent with. Well, and I, I would be happy to take out this, the barring financial considerations. That would be fine. 
No, that that was the important part. If you well, wanted to I add know, something, I, I, those were exactly your words, Matt. So I know, and I yeah. know that um, I know that you said that, and I know that um, I have a similar concerns that we can't make a commitment to something that might not be feasible. But isn't that the case? Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm I mean, just, it's kind, it's kind I'm, of, I disagree with that one. But. I'm just, well, I know that um, because you didn't, so during the discussion, four board members commented on uh, financial considerations. I did, Owen did, Matt Fox did, and Lenny did. And so, uh, so that, I, I thought that that would be, it would be not uh, reflective of the situation if we just said the board committed, the board um, reaffirmed its commitment to a middle school model that doesn't speak to um, okay. what the majority had stated. I guess I would Matt, be more, yeah, go ahead. I, I was the one who said it. I'm fine either way. I mean, I, I could almost say after every single statement I ever say that I like something barring, you know, barring financial, whatever, like, yeah. I like that we have football games barring financial, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. I, I don't know that these are meaningful. I, I know I said it. So either way, I'm fine. I just want to move on from the minutes. <laughs> so I, okay. I, I'm not in favor of it. I think if, if you're going to put something, if you want to put something in there about it, I would put it in as a separate sentence and, and make a disclaimer with it. But I'd, I'd rather not attach it to our uh, reaffirmation of our middle school model, which is what we did at that time. Mm -hmm. Erica, to move along, can we take a simple vote? Yeah, so the current motion is to approve the minutes as presented. That's the current motion. Current motion is to approve the minutes as they are, exist. And I'm ready to move on with the vote. So then you would call a roll call. Okay, I'll call a roll call for approving the minutes as is. Okay, Allenberg? Aye. Fox? Aye. Green? Aye. Jones? No. Michelson? Nay. Shaw? Aye. Wallenstein? Aye. Okay, the um, meetings were approved for the March 23rd, April 13th, and April 16th meeting minutes. Um, now we are going to move on to recognition. And we have Randy Smalzel and Troy Stein here to recognize two accomplish accomplishments in our district. And please know that the board wishes that we were all together in person to congratulate you, but the fact that we're not together doesn't lessen your accomplishments. Um, so Randy, I believe that you're going to go first and talk about Lindsay McDermott. Thank you, uh, Chair Ellenberg. Uh, I'd like to recognize Lindsay McDermott this evening. Uh, Lindsay has earned national board certification as an educator, which is an incredible accomplishment. Um, she is one of 19 nationally board certified teachers we now have in Edina, and there are lots of reasons why these teachers will go after this certification. One, all of them understand that when you get nationally board certified, it's such a rigorous professional learning opportunity for you and it grows you so much. The research actually shows that teachers who have national board certification have classrooms where their students learn more and it has an impact on the students. And I think our teachers who go through the program understand that. It does improve teacher practice. It's uh, been written about significantly about the impact that that has through self-reflection, et cetera, on the teacher's practice is and just overall really demonstrates a commitment to excellence on the part of the teachers. Uh, many times nationally board certified teachers are leaders amongst their peers and um, they do they have a great influence on our school district and we're so proud of Lindsay and her accomplishment this evening and if Lindsay is ready I actually I'm going to interview you Lindsay I have a couple of questions for you and we're going to do this through Google Meet. So um, can you tell us Lindsay like what was the process like how long have you and how long have you been a part of this? Um, so I actually did it last year when I still lived in Philadelphia. I moved to Minnesota in June. So this is my first Minnesota um, teaching position. 
Um, I did all four components in a year, which is pretty crazy. Most people only do uh, one to two. And um, it was a little crazy because halfway through the process, I found out I was moving to Minnesota. So I had to sell my house, get my all my MTLE tests, um, and then get all of my Minnesota certification as well. So it was quite a process. I at one point thought maybe I'm gonna like drop a component, um, but I stuck with it and I'm so glad I did. And I've just, I've had the best year teaching in Edina. And when I got that email in December that I had passed it, it made all of the hours and the hard work and the staying up till midnight and getting up again and teaching pretty much for three months straight and made it all worth it. Lin Lindsay, what would you say would was the biggest challenge in that process? I think I'm a natural writer. I love to write. I um, edit a lot of people's resumes and papers for college. This is a completely different type of writing. You have to take the academic away and you have to sound really selfish almost. You have to always be like, I did this because. Basically the whole thing is Joe proving that you're a good teacher. So I was part of a mentor program where I went um, at least one Saturday a month for an entire week the summer before. And they would be like, no, you need to brag about yourself. And that, that's really hard. And basically every single sentence that you give, you have to prove that you did it for a reason and that what you're doing with kids is not haphazard. It matters. And that I'm able to root my decisions in best practices and data. Thank you, Lindsay. Through this monster accomplishment, what was your biggest learning or your biggest takeaway from this whole process? Well, you're all probably going to laugh right now because thank goodness I chose technology as my <laughs> so you had to pick something you weren't good at. And I'm clearly not that old. I'm 34. But I'm like, I'm, I, I'm not a huge fan of technology. I was a reading specialist for five years. And I'm a huge fan of just putting a book in kids hands, post it notes and a pencil, and then something to track the words. And I truly believe you can teach anything with that. Well, obviously, times are changing. So when it came time to pick an area for professional development, I obviously needed to do technology. So I agreed to be coached by a district technology coach and learned how to use smart board technology. I learned how to, um, you know, better message parents through different apps. And I learned how to use Google Classrooms. So, you know, this year I was actually able to use my Promethean board. And I met with Sean Beaverson and started learning how to use Schoology and slowly upload things. So when the global pandemic came, I just looked at my husband. I'm like, I am so glad I did the national boards because I think it would have been an absolute disaster had I didn't have that base. So luckily, I mean, it has, I've had a few nights where I've almost cried because Google Forms weren't uploaded correctly to Schoology, but overall it's been a lot more seamless than if I had not done this process. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's about making it best for my students. And I'm sure those students have felt that and are very fortunate. You're uh, grade four Cornelia students. Uh, what advice would you give to another teacher considering a national board certification? I think it is definitely worth the process. I think you need to go into it knowing that you're going to commit. Like I had a huge curveball thrown to me. My husband actually moved to Minnesota. So I was alone um, selling the house, packing up, and I was still able to do it. So I think that even if there are obstacles, you can still get through it. I also think that it's something you should wait to do until, I'm trying to word this properly, until you're truly a master teacher. I There was I think, you know, someone had mentioned it to me, maybe my fifth or sixth year teaching. And I just, I think I was a good teacher then, but I don't think I had the maturity and the reflection and that ability to really look into myself. So I think that's really important to make sure that you really feel confident in your craft and you're really willing to be critical because, you know, you might find some things that you're like, oh yeah, I don't really do that anymore. Maybe I did my first year when I was getting observed more often. And it forces you to look at yourself and try to be the best teacher you can be every lesson, every class. 
Thank you for that awesome advice, Lindsay. You're clearly a, a very inspirational teacher, and I'm sure the students this year and moving forward will continue to benefit uh, from your experience. And thank you so much for uh, the commitment you've made in education and to our Edina students. Um, it is it is very impressive to watch teachers go through uh, this incredibly rigorous process. So on, on behalf of the Teaching and Learning Department, Edina Public Schools, congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. And we'll turn it back over to Chair Ellenberg. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. Congratulations. Um, great. So now we're going to turn it over to Troy. And I believe we have the boys swimming and diving coaches here to their state championship. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Troy Stein, uh, Assistant Principal, Director of Athletics and Activities at Edina High School. And, um, uh, Board Chair Allenberg and Superintendent Schultz, thanks for having me and our boys swim and dive program represented uh, tonight at the school board. Uh, we're extremely proud of uh, the accomplishment this past winter season uh, from our team. Uh, they went back to back state championships uh, uh, the last two years, which is remarkable. Uh, they won the school, the 187th state championship uh, this year, which is a, a state record and, and still counting. Um, I'm extremely proud of the program, our coaches, our athletes, and tonight uh, we have representation from our coaching staff and then we have our senior captains with us. And I'll introduce them and then we'll do a little interview as well. Um, with us tonight is head coach Scott Johnson, assistant coach Jeff Mate, uh, Greg Pekorski, and our diving coach John Daly. We have captains with us tonight, Baker, Jacob Biskin, Liam DeMuth, and Charlie Webb. And uh, I just want to say that uh, this is just an amazing uh, group of, of young men in our program. Uh, they represent uh, Edina uh, in all their finest qualities. They, they're extremely dedicated, they're passionate, and uh, they have uh, a great purpose in what they do. And uh, while, while we're recognizing them for an amazing achievement, uh, in winning a state championship. Uh, I'm more than that proud of how they represent us uh, in life, in school, and in our community. So with that, I would like to uh, first off introduce uh, our head swim and dive coach and a teacher at uh, Valley View, Scott Johnson. If you could just uh, say a few words on, uh, on the season, your thoughts uh, on the year, and uh, uh, tell us what you're thinking. Uh, thank you, Troy. Uh, good afternoon, board members and uh, other members of the district and administrators. Um, we're, we're very pleased to be here today to be recognized from the board, and uh, we, we enjoy representing Edina uh, in a general fashion uh, and as a community, and then also specifically in the swimming and diving community. As uh, Mr. Stein has alluded, we do have a tremendous a uh, talented, gifted group of young men and athletes, and they represent themselves as student athletes in an exemplary fashion. Very pleased to bring them uh, anywhere that we go. Uh, they, 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 they are Edina proud, and um, very, very sad to see these uh, young men go as I've been working with them for the past four years. Uh, so uh, that you can be assured that that our athletes do represent Edina in the in the best way possible, and I'm uh, just just very pleased uh, for their efforts. Scott, Scott, I want to follow up. At, at what point did you kind of feel like this team had a had a chance to win it all? Was there any moment during the season that uh, you kind of felt like this team could do it? Um, well, to be honest, I I felt that four years ago. Uh, when these guys came on as freshmen onto the program, I knew that we really had a really group of a really special group of athletes. These guys have been these guys have been hauling the mail for you know since they were nine and ten years old. Uh, they've been tearing up the age group circuit. Um, their times keep showing up over and over, and they just continued to do everything that we asked them to do. Not only in the water, but but out of the water and in the classroom as well. So. Um, I think we knew that we had something special when they came on, and and we still do. There's there's still a 
um, large number of underclassmen that are that are doing the same and following in the footsteps of these captains. Thank you, uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, I'm going to go over to uh, assistant coach Jeff Mace, and uh, Jeff is also our uh, head girls swim and dive coach. And and coach Mace, uh, you uh, as a head girls coach have have also you're also on an amazing streak right now with the number of state champions. I think you went four straight with uh, state championships. Um, what what can you attribute to the strong swimming success of both our boys and girls swim and dive program right now? Well, as Scott alluded to, they, uh, they put the time in, they put the effort in. And I guess I want to say about the senior leadership on both programs, um, they say a team well led will rise to greater heights and the seniors and more important or just as important, the captains and the seniors together do a great job of setting an example of what needs to be done without complaining, without any type of uh, distraction to the program. They are all in. They're all in 100% behind the staff and they lead the other kids on the team. And so it's just a, it's just a joy to work with them every day. Well said. I, I appreciate that. And there's no doubt. We'll get to our captains in a second. There's no doubt that they are some fine young men. Uh, Coach uh, Greg Pekorski, I'm gonna. I would. I would love for you to chime in. Thanks for being here tonight. Tell us. Uh, tell us a, a moment uh, this season that will uh, stay with you with this group. Um. Well, this the uh, the seniors captains had an opportunity to. Uh, participate in the first uh, ever grade level relays for the boys teams. Um, every grade got to put up its best possible relay at a dual meet and compete against each other. And uh, just to see not only the the seniors step up and, and defend their title as the, the leaders of the team as well as they did, but also to see how close it was for the groups of boys that are juniors, sophomores, and freshmen trying to to keep up with them and follow their lead was really impressive and fun to watch. Well, that, that, that is great information. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I know we had some mic difficulties with our diving coach, John Daly. Uh, John, are you able to uh, share anything from your sp perspective from the diving program? Have you been able to uh, get this technology going for you? I think I have, yeah. All right. Um, no, actually, this year, uh, you know, the guys did it in, did an incredible job. We actually, once, what's kind of fun is we actually welcomed some of the, a couple of seniors. This year, we had three seniors who decided for the first time to come out for diving. Uh, they all, they all achieved lists that qualified them to be able to go to, to the section meet. We ended up with two of our divers at state, and one of them, um, Max Dieters, who finished third in the state high school meet. Um, it's quite an accomplishment when you consider the fact that last year he was 10th and eight of the nine divers ahead of him were all back this year. So he managed to leapfrog a number of divers to be able to finish third. Uh, so it was quite an accomplishment. Thank you, Coach, and uh, a great story with with a growth mindset and continuing to uh, enjoy enjoy the sport and just uh, continue to grow with that passion. Uh, let's go to our captains now, and and um, you know, Coach Mays talked about our, our strong senior leadership. There's no doubt the four of you are are amazing in that capacity. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, I'll, I'll ping each of you, and when when I do, uh, introduce yourselves. Um, talk about um, uh, an event that uh, you have great passion specifically swimming in. And then if you could um, tell us what your plans are for next year and your most memorable experience uh, from the season. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, Gabe. And again, if you can introduce yourself, your plans for next year, um, uh, event that you really have a great passion for and memorable experience. Uh, Gabe's not in this. 
Gabe left us, huh? Yeah. Charlie, why don't you, why don't you uh, take it off? All right. Uh, my name is Charlie Webb. I am a captain. I will be going to University of Michigan, Ann Arbor next year, and I will not be swimming. An event I'm passionate for, I've always had a passion for the 200 freestyle. I've done that more times than I can count on the team, and I swim it at the state meet all four of my years. And I'd say that some of my best moments are from uh, cheering on Mike Lee, who is a diver who isn't the strongest of divers. But for some reason, we started a tradition of all just absolutely rioting every time he went off the board. So that was some of my favorite memories came from cheering from him just because it was so much fun to get really hyped for him. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Uh, Liam, I'm going to go over to you next. Why don't you introduce Hi. yourself and, and uh, talk through the season as we discussed. Thank you, Mr. Stein. Hi, I'm Liam DeMuth. Uh, next year, I'll be attending Miami University in Ohio. And then uh, I've always held close to me is also the 200 free. I've swam that at three out of the four years at state. And it's always been one that I've, it's always been in my wheelhouse. Um, one of my most memorable moments is probably every year at sections. It's by far my favorite swimming weekend of the year, just because it really brings out the team atmosphere. And it's great to see the underclassmen, uh, finally make their first state cut and accomplish everything that they've been working for. And I'll always remember those moments. I appreciate that and, and thank you and, and, and certainly good luck. Uh, and let's go over to Jacob. Hi, I'm Jacob Biskin. Next year, I'll be going to uh, University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and I will be swimming. Uh, my favorite event is probably the 200 IM, which I've swam four years at the state meet. Um, my favorite memory from this year is just uh, every day going to practice and working as hard as we can to push each other and then seeing it all come together at the section of the state meet and just watching everybody improve and support each other and help each other as teammates. I love to hear that. Uh, there's there's no doubt that um, if if a team and a, and a group of teammates can come together and really enjoy that competition, uh, the limits are endless. So, uh, fellas, I really appreciate you joining us. Um, I want to send uh, a final congratulations to all of you, not only all of you uh, here in the, the chat with us, but also to the entire boys swim and dive program. And if we could get everybody to join me in an applause with raising your hands uh, in sign language fashion, congratulations to our boys swim and dive program. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. And congratulations to the entire swim and dive program. Um, I just wanted to comment. I'm got to compete and finish their season and Troy I want to extend to you if you could um, let the spring athletes know that our hearts go out to them and anyone involved in spring activities um, that they aren't able to compete right now especially these seniors um, please let our student athletes know that we uh, hope that they might be able to compete but that we're thinking about them so Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. We're thinking about them. Uh, Charlie, I know you are a spring athlete as well, and, and we're uh, we're thinking of you, but all of you that uh, we would love to be able to make it work this spring, and we continue to look for options. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you to everyone for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are going to move on now. Um, next, we have um, Excellence in Action, and this is Volunteer Appreciation Week, and we thought it would be a perfect time to talk about um, excellence in our school district and look at the ways volunteers are making a difference throughout our school district. Greetings and happy National Appreciation Week to all of our amazing volunteers. Although we're currently separated for the health and safety of our community, we want you to know how grateful we are for your support today and every day. 
The impact you make on students' lives academically, socially, and emotionally is a tremendous and priceless gift. Thank you for sharing your time and talents with Edina Public Schools and community education. We hope that you and your loved ones are doing well, and we look forward to the day we all reunite stronger than ever. Hello, Spots and I are here to thank you for everything that you've done, volunteering for our school district in support of our staff, our families, and our students. There's so many different ways each and every one of you have contributed to make a difference for us from academic support to mentorships, to special events, to classroom presentations, youth enrichment programs, to college and career readiness. The list really goes on and on. Even though we're physically apart right now, we just want you to know that our gratitude is ever present. Please dedicate some time to yourself and celebrate all the wonderful ways that you have supported our mission and the students this school year. We certainly will be celebrating you. To all Edina Public Schools and community education volunteers, we wanna wish you a happy National Volunteer Appreciation Month. While our lives have temporarily taken a drastic turn, we look forward to when we can see and honor you in person. Until then, we hope you know how much you truly mean to us. The state of Minnesota is a leader in philanthropy, so we know that there are a wealth of organizations for you to volunteer with. We are so grateful you have chosen us to receive the gifts of your time and talents. From our homes to yours, thank you. Okay, now we're going to move to um, reading of community input regarding agenda items. And we did not receive any emails specifically for tonight's meeting, but I did want to mention that we received a few emails over the last month related to distance learning um, and asking some questions regarding um, what is happening next, whether it's summer um, or concerns if students had been missing, um, missing out on some learning. So I'm hoping that our distance learning update later in the meeting will provide some answers to these questions. A lot of answers are still unknown right now um, as we're awaiting direction from the state, but we're still planning for many different scenarios as a district. So I just wanted to highlight um, the couple of emails that we have gotten um, from the community. Um, next on the agenda are our we're going to move on to that agenda. Is there anything anyone wants to remove from the consent agenda? Then do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Ellen's hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, I have um, two things I'd like to remove, the um, policy 410 and the policy 616. Policy 410. Okay. Um, those will remove, will, I'm sorry, will be removed. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda without policy 410 and 616? Removed. Is second. there a second? Okay, we will now vote by roll call to approve the consent agenda. Allenberg? Aye. Fox? Aye. Green? Aye. Jones? Aye. Michelson? Aye. Shaw? Aye. Mullen Friedman? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. The consent agenda has been approved. Is there a motion to approve policy 410? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, Ellen, did you want to discuss 410? Yeah, I, all I'm, I'd like um, this to be sent back to the policy committee. There's a paragraph missing um, that defines the, what a year is. And um, so I, I think that that ought to be added. Um, it's, it's different from um, the model policy. The model policy describes the year and it's mentioned. It. I think it's just a typo oversight, but I think it should be added. Ellen, as policy chair, could you send me an email um, with that exact language? Um, I can actually, I think it would be just as easy maybe if I 
I gave it to you now, or well, yes, I can. Whatever you prefer. Well, is there I like is there a, an edit that we can make right now and pass it? Um, I actually I saw that one, and I didn't I didn't continue going through the policy, so um, I would not recommend that. Um, I don't I don't know how you are um, reviewing policy now for. Um, um, in the policy committee. So if um, there, there may be more than one, I don't know. So what's missing from the policy? I'm trying to find it. I'm so sorry. There's a paragraph missing and it is missing in um, section, hold on, going through my notes. Um, Um, it's section 4A number 2. So it would be following the 12-week leave under federal law. And because this is so prescripted, I feel, I hate being a real dweeb and pointing out the details, but it what should be added is for purposes of this policy, year is defined as a rolling 12-month period measured backward from the date an employee's leave is to commence. We have that defined. It's um, K. Right. It's in the policy elsewhere. It's in the policy 3 under definitions K. Okay, well, um, oh, okay. Well, I see that's there. It, is there anything else in that policy that? Like I said, I stopped when I saw that, so. Um, one of the things that I was going to mention, and, and we don't need to talk about it at this point because we're talking about a particular policy, but um, I would like to talk uh, about how um, we're presenting our policies and doing the policy review. So that's what I would suggest. Um, if everybody else is confident that this is fine and it sounds like uh, the policy committee is recommending that, um, then I would be fine in moving forward. Okay. One thing, this is Owen, that I'd like to interject here is that these four policies that we had on consent were up for annual review. And so this will come up again next year, too. So within a reasonably short interval of time, we'll be visiting with 410 again. So okay. if that's any reassurance for you, yeah, yeah. Owen. Yeah, that's okay. I and Like I said, I just saw that one paragraph and I thought, well, I don't know how you're doing this. Um, it didn't look like it was there, so. Okay, is there a motion to approve policy 410? I think we've already had the motion. I had the motion. You have to vote. Oh, I'm sorry. There, you're right. We're in the middle of it. Sorry. We'll now vote by roll call to approve 410. Ellenberg? Aye. Fox? Aye. Green? Aye. Jones? Aye. Michelson? Aye. Chaw? Aye. Wallen Friedman? Aye. Okay, policy 410 is approved. Um, is there a motion to approve policy 616? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay, um, in this discussion, I think I'm gonna be the one that's discussing this most. Um, I think that we have learned a lot from um, distance learning and um, I wanted just to send this back for a review for distance learning um, um, for best practices for what's going on right now. Ellen, do you have any particular thoughts that prompt this? Anything, any angle that you would be interested in having us look at past distance learning? What about distance learning would this uh, engage you? Um, 
I don't want to take time at the meeting right now for all for for that, but I could email mm -hmm. you. Um, I, mostly it is it's that we designed the policy before um, the all of these changes are ta taking place. And I'm just wondering if that was um, part of what you guys were look you were looking at this policy with an eye toward that. Okay. So, Erica, is it a point of order? Can Ellen email that to no, the members no. of the board and not violate? No. That's a violation of open meeting law. So first of all, I'm confused. Are we looking at school district system accountability? Or what? Because that's policy 616. Right. Or was the intent to look at electronic? I was, the intent was 634. Sorry. Because right now, right now we're okay. looking at. Well, I, I screwed up. Sorry. Never mind. We can't. It, 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 we're, we're, you can take this off the table or we can just vote that in. And we've already voted for it. My concerns were on 634, which is guidelines for classroom use of social media tools and for other, other issues that are, that relate to everything we're doing with distance learning. So, but I, I'm sorry, I wrote the, the wrong. No, that's okay. I just, because I thought that's what you meant, but then. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Okay. And, um, and so um, never mind. We just, we already voted for 634 in the consent agenda. Um, and, you know, it's it, 634 has all of the personal device access in it and it has all sorts of other in, in stuff so i'm really sorry I, I used the wrong number but now no but i don't I, the point you bring up i don't think is a, a bad point and that's why i think that i've been working with john to pull up policies that might have the things that we need to look at from a policy perspective so i don't i don't think your point is a bad one but i, I think we just have to vote on 616. so as the 634 perhaps steve can take a look at it with randy and yeah. then provide feedback yeah. Um, so we will now vote by roll call to approve 616, policy 616. Hold on one second. Allenberg? Aye. Fox? Aye. Green? Aye. Aye. Sorry. Jones? Aye. Michelson? Aye. Shaw? Aye. Wallen Friedman? Aye. Um, so policy 616 is approved. Um, and I can touch base afterwards, like uh, Lenny said, about um, having Randy and um, Steve look at that policy as, re as it relates. I'll take care of that. Okay. I'll take care of that. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we're on to reports and presentations. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the evening, the American Indian um, presentation is postponed due to the illness of. Um, a um, administrator. So um, the presentation tonight we have um, teaching and learning. We have Randy and Steve here to talk about um, distance learning and some impacts on initiatives. Why don't I? Oh, actually, we have a lot of pre presenters. Yeah. So why don't I? Wow. Kick it off. Go for it, John. Um, so just uh, this is a uh, opportunity for us to share with the school board as well as the community um, our response to uh, COVID nineteen. If you recall a school district to um, set, set services in three different areas. One is in meals, one is in child care, and the other, which is the most impactful, has been distance learning, which we've been talking about for uh, about four or five weeks now. Um, first of all, as, as the school district leader, um, it is uh, amazing to watch the collaborative spirit, to watch the amount of effort and work that staff are uh, that staff across the, all departments across all levels are putting in to ensuring that the learning is uh, is consistent and seamless uh, the best we can from being in our classrooms to being at home as I've said several times we've taken about 8,000 students from nine or ten sites and put them into um, uh, probably around five six five thousand homes I, a rough estimate so it, five thousand buildings so managing that has been has been interesting 
um, challenging, but uh, the challenge has been met with a great collaborative spirit of problem solving and um, everybody in this district deserves um, a recognition for this. Um, it has just been um, amazing uh, to be uh, a leader uh, working with this very talented group of people in this district, but also extend that to our school board, to our community that have been very supportive and collaborate and help us pro problem solve uh, through the many things that um, happen when we shift to what's happening in the classrooms to what's happening at home. Um, you've probably watched on on um, the media as well as um, in different places you've read or in conversations that uh, we are still looking, uh, the governor has not indicated that um, uh, that there's a different date than May 4th. Uh, May 4th would be the start of school again. We are still waiting and have our hunches that uh, we would go to the end of our school year, which is May 29th. Um, but we still are looking at May 4th, and as we do in Edina, we ensure we plan for that in the event that that could happen. So we are working on that. We are also working on summer programming. Um, in the event something changes, uh, we have several contingency plans for summer programming uh, to support our summer, um, our, our, our summer students that attend summer school. Um, that also includes the extended school year within special, special ed. Um, we are looking at all of the end of the year celebrations right now. Um, many of them in, in include things like senior party, prom, commencement, the scholar athlete breakfast, the uh, scholarship uh, celebrations, the fifth grade, prom uh, fifth grade promotion to eighth grade promotion to ninth grade. All of those celebrations where we are, we are thinking about. Um, so um, with that, um, it's uh, the, the important piece is to really manage, respect, and ensure that we've got the uh, social emotional support of our, of our families, our students, and our staff. Um, that's uh, first and foremost in making this transition because it's stressful uh, not only implementing a new system, it's also stressful in how our lives have changed. So uh, uh, Edina leadership and our teachers have taken time to um, time to reflect and time to uh, be with families and we will continue that commitment and priority. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Randy Smazel, Director of Teaching Learning and uh, Steve Butner to talk about our, our, big, our biggest work um, and that's been the distance learning. Um, they've got some interesting data and uh, the activities that we've done over the past five weeks to share with the community and with the board. So Randy, can I turn it over to you? Sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Schultz. Um, good evening, uh, Chair Allenberg, board members, community members, and those who are able to view this online. Um, we are here presenting tonight, as Dr. Schultz mentioned, uh, about our response to the COVID-19 uh, distance learning plans for Edina Public Schools. And I would like to just publicly take a moment to thank uh, many of our teachers and administrators who are working so hard every day to meet the needs of kids, our paras, all of our staff, transportation, so many people collaborating together. And uh, I also would like to thank uh, those folks who are here this evening. So Steve Butner, Leah Bird, Karen Bergman, Mark DeYoung, uh, Dr. Tim Anderson, uh, Sean Dudley also contributed to this presentation, Andy Beaton, Mark Carlson, Caroline Linden, Uli Rodriguez, Sean Beaverson, and Mike Walker. Um, They're just unbelievably talented, amazing people to work with every day and truly feel blessed um, to be able to have a job where I get to partner alongside of them. Um, if you'll go on the next slide, Steve. So um, John did a great job describing some of the why behind this and, and what we're trying to accomplish. And really this whole distance learning process has been about responding to this pandemic. And really it's about emergency learning in this situation. Uh, I will say Edina was well positioned for many of the challenges that this brought forward and that had to do with uh, being prepared for e-learning and inclement weather and having a plan uh, pre-k-12 for what we would do if we had cold weather days or we had snowy weather days 
Um, we also had curriculum work where um, activity boards were prepared at the elementary and our secondary staff had lessons prepared that they could deliver in Schoology. Uh, we have many technology systems and infrastructure that helped us prepare for the launch and, and Steve helped close the gap with his department to identify those in need of access and technology and be able to deliver those items to folks. We've had um, you know, a lot of training for staff. Um, and it's just been an incredible collaborative effort with so many people to be able to pull this together. Slide three. In terms of a timeline, we actually started some of this work uh, previously, previous to the governor's announcement. And we were fortunate to have um, some secondary staff development time on March 13th to train our secondary staff so that we were uh, better prepared for that announcement that was coming. And you, you'll notice that on March 15th, um, that's when our governor announced that the um, schools would be moving to distance learning and immediately that later that day, within two hours of that announcement, we had a team of administrators, school board members, principals, teacher leaders, other staff in Edina that gathered together and started to build a general outline and a general plan about how we were going to proceed. And then over the course of that next weekend, of that next week, there was just a great amount of training. There was the building of instructional guidelines and collaboration around um, instructional parameters. There was technology training and throughout the week, we were preparing teachers for that launch because um, we really had five days to do this because teachers were going on to spring break. I think it's important to note that many districts had two weeks to prepare uh, because their spring break timed out a little bit later. But uh, our district literally had five days of this. Many of our teachers worked over their spring break voluntarily uh, attending professional development sessions that um, some others will talk about this evening. But just an incredible commitment of our staff to try and create a great experience for our learners. Um, in terms of the different things that we were trying to think through in the different stages, you know, one of the first considerations were, you know, how do we make this an equitable experience across the district and for our students? And so we put time into looking at um, what needs to be tight as a system in terms of instructional frames and delivery and uh, had those dialogues at the high school, at the middle school level, at the elementary level, and at the early learning center level. And then in terms of being prepared, it was really about, once we went live, it was really about reconnecting and developing some routines with our students. And so reestablishing those relationships, uh, letting uh, our students know that our teachers are here for them and here's how we're going to move forward and get started. And we're continuing to adapt. We're continuing to support the operations by looking for feedback. Uh, we right now have some feedback forms out to the community and about 20% of our families have responded. So we're hoping that other families will dig into that email and, and give us some feedback. That, that uh, first feedback form will close this Thursday at 4 p.m. So there's a few more days yet to enter that. And then we'll also be collecting some formal feedback from staff and from students, which is, um, I believe, headed to them this week. And um, so we really appreciate uh, being able to partner with our families to continue to manage and adapt as we need to moving forward. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean and Mike to talk a little bit about the distance learning training and um, the next uh, six slides or so here. Uh, <clears throat> the order of operations was Mike began the secondary training on Friday, so I'm going to let him go first. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, and thank you to members of the board and uh, Superintendent Schultz and others for inviting us tonight. Um, we had done some research, Sean and I, and 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 others looking at uh, other uh, schools that had started this process before we had schools in S Southeast Asia and Europe, and uh, to kind of gather some best practice in regards to this. And so when we we looked at distance learning, we we saw the vocabulary coming up a lot, the asynchronous uh, being for more deep learning where kids are not necessarily working in, in real time with one another per se or with the teacher, but uh, teachers posting things and students responding uh, when they could versus synchronous learning uh, being used primarily to maintain relationships. And and so that kind of formed a foundation of some of our work is uh, 
Randy said, we utilized a lot of the secondary standpoint of our e-learning training that had been done back in the fall to kind of put a framework of how we were going to do it. We had the benefit of all of our secondary staff utilizing Schoology as our learning management system where we would uh, house content and activities for students. Sean? Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you to the board. Thank you, Dr. Schultz, and to the public. Uh, it is a privilege, actually, to get to share some of this work with you. Um, it has been um, some of the most challenging work I've participated in my career and some of the most rewarding. Uh, the training that happened for elementary staff began on the Tuesday uh, after the governor closed the school. And just at, to highlight the rapid pace of change in this, we had planned for uh, Tuesday learning across grade level bands that in the Normandale auditorium that would host 50 people at a time. That was at the time what the recommended number of people were uh, in, uh, in proximity. Uh, by the time we got to the mid-afternoon of Monday after the emails had gone out, that guideline had changed to 10 people in the room. So um, the very nature of everything that we were doing was changing incredibly rapidly. Uh, we took the information that we had, we presented that to staff on Tuesday. Uh, from my perspective, the staff was um, incredibly generous, um, thoughtful, kind, appreciative of what was going on and what needed to happen. So we, uh, without as many answers at the elementary level uh, where kids aren't as independent, uh, where much of our relationship is based in the classroom because that is the most appropriate place for it to be based, um, we laid out the framework of what we hope to accomplish in four days. And so uh, in those two days, so between the secondary training on Friday and then the training on Tuesday, uh, the entire staff across um, the Dinah Public Schools uh, was prepared. I just did a quick check because we did live stream uh, the presentations to staff. So I just wanted to check in those videos that we prepared and presented to staff have had over 400 views. And uh, I've done a lot of professional learning in my life. And I, it's that's a pretty good number for me. I don't really usually get to, to 40. So 400 was pretty good. <laughs> Go ahead and continue, Sean and Mike, on our distance learning plan. So I'm just going to highlight really quickly. I'm going to let Mike talk more about the full development of this. But uh, this this... One of the things that we've had as a benefit for uh, us and our community is that we're connected to the broader community. Uh, it's been a mission of Adina Public Schools uh, to have a global view. Uh, it is something that uh, our departments value. And so we have benefited from having a global view. The website uh, that we developed for the Adina Distance Learning Plan was uh, borrowed, lifted, uh, inspired by uh, an international school in Japan, the YAS International School. I saw their site, uh, sent them an email and said, this is amazing. They were about a month ahead of the curve than we were and said, uh, can I take this? And they said, of course, just let us know what you do with it when you're done. And so just another quick nod to that. And then I'm gonna let Mike take, I did, I did, I mean, I'm curious about these things uh, and so I did do some looking. Uh, during that first week when we uh, presented this website uh, to the community, we had 13,000 page views and 4,485 users used that site uh, during the first week of distance learning to get the information. So I'll let Mike cover more about what's in that. Yeah, so we, uh, as part of this, as Sean said, we uh, stood on the shoulders of many, many people to support us as well as uh, collaboration within the district. So as you look at all the different levels from ELC all the way through the high school, you'll see um, collaboration on every page with the content that was put together for that page and um, the support of, of administrators, media specialists, principals, and one of the things that uh, I was really uh, excited about is the fact that uh, some of our students uh, collaborated to some of the with some of the content that was included um, on our high school. We had kids designing templates for planners. We had kids making videos and 
proper behavior when they're doing a, a meet and things like that. And so um, it was a great collaborative effort uh, amongst the buildings, the uh, ML department, special ed department to uh, put all this together. And then this, uh, the next slide, uh, again, we, we did benefit uh, from the learning uh, of those who were going through this situation before us. And uh, one of the things that we learned, uh, which is something that when you think about it or when you have knowledge of it, uh, it makes sense, but that the primary concern immediately needs to be the relationships and routines that you're able to set. And, and what our families, what our parents understood, uh, what our teachers understood was that this was going to be a trying time for everybody. And so did a lot of work during those initial weeks to set up routines in order to maintain the relationships so they could continue learning. And as you look at um, you know, leaning on what we had already accomplished as a district. Uh, as you think about our the work uh, one that, one computing, uh, we've been able to do with our technology plans, with the uh, levy referendum that's supported technology in the district, we were in a much better place. And uh, being able to utilize things like our learning framework to look at how can we provide choice for students to how they're accessing content, how they're interacting with that content content, how they're expressing learning. This is, uh, we're, we're relying on a lot of that as part of it. And so um, the digital age learning that we've talked about, the different models of uh, digital age learning with SAMR and other things to, that we talk with staff about, uh, we've been able to rely on and expand upon because of the work that we've done over the years. This next slide reflects uh, while we weren't able to meet face to face. If you look at that, the average duration of one of these video sessions uh, for staff has been 41 minutes. Uh, during since the beginning of this uh, emergency, there's been uh, this was taken a week ago, so I guarantee that there's a lot more than this now. 19,000 uh, participants in Google Meet sessions, uh, and so I just like to highlight uh, that that those numbers to me represent a deep dedication and connection throughout the organization. The next slide also reflects uh, our efforts around learning. So uh, we have um, all of our staff are enrolled in one of two sites, uh, some in both the K-5 Distance Learning Schoology site and the Edina Secondary Distance Learning site. That it, small image there represents, uh, I think, 30 different YouTube videos of different Google Meet PD sessions that people participated in. The highest one uh, that I saw was 130 teachers in one Google Meet session for professional learning to prepare for this emergency. And so just want to provide some statistics that we have about what is it looking like uh, for our distance learning or our emergency learning. Um, as, as we mentioned, we did bef uh, the first week, we did have an opportunity for uh, parents to come into the district and pick up uh, instructional materials and other materials, but we quickly found after the first week that we had to do more. Since uh, that Tuesday of that first week of planning, we've checked out over 4,000 library books to our students so that there'd be books at home so that students could read. We've distributed over 1,387 Chromebooks and we continue to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. We have a plan in place to distribute Chromebooks for families that need them or when there's a repair device needed, 120 internet hotspots. Uh, I think one of the points of pride of this whole um, in this whole experience has been when we delivered that on a Monday two weeks ago, when we actually drove around in school buses and delivered it. Uh, here's the Facebook post about that, and we were pretty proud of being able to bring learning to homes. If you look at our attendance numbers, you'll see the attendance numbers on this slide. Uh, for elementary and secondary, and you'll see that the elementary is still experiencing pretty high uh, attendance rates. We do take attendance on a daily basis. We had one dip on uh, April 9th, which so happens to be the same uh, day right before uh, Easter, Good Friday or Easter Sunday. But if you look at it across the district compared to last year's information, you'll see something interesting, and that is that we have actually during 
our distance learning, we have actually a higher percentage attendance than we did last year at a comparable uh, uh, time span. So here's over uh, 12 days, and you'll look at uh, 1819 and 1920. You do see that in year 1819, there was a day of 100%. That actually was a snow day. And so we did mark 100% attendance. But other than that, we've had higher attendance this year than we did at a comparable time last year. If you look at our learning management systems for our, K, our early learning center, kindergarten, first and second grade, we use a platform called Seesaw. And you can see that there's been exponential growth of that tool with parent visits on a day-to-day -day basis. Here's a, a sample of, of types of works that are being submitted by um, our, our students and our families. On the left-hand side, you'll see a math worksheet that a parent has taken a picture and submitted. So um, though the medium for delivery is technology, notice that not everything we do is technology-based. So these students are encouraged not just to uh, work on computer screens, but also work on workbooks and other paper. And the slide to the right, you'll see a element uh, Normandale uh, work, and it's a daily checklist. And again, I point out is that they're I, the hope is, is that students are playing outside for 30 minutes and doing reading and doing the morning message. So again, we are using the platform to deliver the content, but that doesn't mean that our students are on technology all day long. If you look at our Schoology numbers, which is our platform we use for third through 12th grade, again, you'll see a large dip. The sixth and seventh day is a weekend day. And so even during the weekend, we're experiencing higher numbers and we're seeing a uh, great use of that uh, platform as well. And uh, Mike or and Sean, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the examples we have for our Schoology templates? Yeah, so just very quickly, uh, one of the one of the you know uh, I'm reticent to use the word gain in this situation, but one of the gains that we've had or one of the things that we've discovered is having teacher teams work together. So what the site represents is the entire fourth grade team in one Schoology course at uh, Concord. And uh, then also included in that is the specialists. And so this picture here represents what a fourth grade student at Concord will see when they come uh, to their online learning platform, which um, is really a very remarkably uh, tuned view of what you're going to do for the day. At middle, at middle school, here's a 21st century literacy course where the students come in, they've got some specific things that they're doing on a given day. They may have unit guides uh, to kind of support some of that, but they're always, when they come in, they see that upcoming work in the upper right-hand corner for any given course. And if you go to the next slide, Steve, you'll see the same kind of a thing at the high school where um, this is a class where they've got some really nice uh, structure to it. And and the thing that uh, our high school students have appreciated is seeing that the whole week in advance that many of our teachers are putting out uh, so that they know exactly what's happening for the whole week there as they, as they take a look. So that's been very helpful. When you look at a specific example inside of Schoology, you can see this happens to be a sixth grade science class, but you can see the directions for the day. Uh, teachers putting links in there, and then uh, they might be viewing a, a, a video or doing some learning that's uh, being captured in some way. Now we'll turn it over to some principals for input. Uh, Randy, just take it away. I think we have uh, Leah Bird, um, Karen Bergman, and uh, Mark DeYoung to talk about the next couple of slides. And they're just going to articulate a little bit about what some of the successes have been in early learning and K-5 and what some of the challenges have been. And then after that, we'll ask Tim Anderson, um, Andy Beaton, any of our secondary administrators, um, to kind of do a, a repeat of that for the secondary experience. So uh, I'll turn it over to those. 
Great. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is Karen Bergman. I'm the principal at Countryside Elementary. And uh, with me tonight, Mark DeYoung, assistant principal at Concord Elementary, and Leah Bird, who is our uh, coordinator uh, principal as such at the Early Learning Center. So um, we'd like to share just a few things about successes that we have found. Um, I'm, I have always likened all of our experiences back to that first week of distance learning, and it was shaped around creating routines and relationships for our kids. Um, those routines, getting everyone in the groove of, um, of what we wanted them to do and what they would be seeing once we got to a point where we would start um, delivering some content uh, to, to the instruction. Um, First and foremost, though, uh, it's about relationships. We needed an opportunity, uh, a vehicle to make sure that our kids were reconnected and um, spending time with their teachers. Um, getting back in the groove of, of school meant uh, spending time with their teachers. So um, we use that technology as a vehicle for that in those initial days. And I will tell you that even though we used it as a vehicle, we learned so much. Our teachers, the learning curve um, has been tremendous just in the way that we, at the elementary, we just don't teach this way. Um, so we are learning lots as far as what that looks like. Um, and uh, hopefully this will do nothing more than enhance what will happen in the classrooms once we're able to be back together. Um, so I'll turn it over to Leah to continue a little bit about a uh, little bit more about some of the successes we found. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Schultz and Chair Board, um, Allen Berg, school board members, colleagues, community. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you a little bit more about some of our successes. And um, one of the bullet points I'm going to speak to is connections and social emotional growth. And, kind of as Karen spoke about, one of the things that we know is so important was the relationships our teachers had with their kiddos and setting up their routines so that this non, um, this new normal felt as normal as our, our last um, time we were together. So we've, we've learned one of our successes is that our staff are able to connect differently with kids and families. And that's really a testament to the flexibility our staff have to say, wow, this is different and new, but I'm going to figure it out and, and connect with those kids. And we've also really had an opportunity to use some of our additional staff in our schools, um, think about our paraprofessionals and have them assigned to specific kids and families to just make sure that they could reach out to them. Um, right at the very beginning of distance learning. And then I'll turn it over to Mark. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Mark Young, Assistant Principal at Concord. Uh, one of the successes uh, academically that we've uh, found is that some of our kids who have not uh, flourished previously now are exceeding. I've had a number of teachers tell me, wow, I've gotten so much out of this kid. I can't believe it. These connections that I'm making with some of these kids via distance learning is so much more that we had not seen before. Um, and I think another academic success is parents having a better understanding of the curriculum um, and just being sort of thrown into that position where they're also sort of more of a partner than they were previously with us and getting those connections is great. And the personalization of instruction uh, now um, is incredible, whether it be through Google Hangouts or through emails, but providing that meaningful uh, feedback that uh, teachers are giving to kids uh, is a big win. And, you know, I think about we got into this profession because we wanted to help de develop kids and that whole person. And that really goes back to what Karen was talking about and Leah was talking about that relationship piece. And when I think about what it is for us as elementary staff, those connections with kids is huge. And all of those things that we're working on developing the whole person, it really comes into play when you're talking about distance learning and those 21st century skills of critical thinking and collaboration and communication and creativity. I mean, this is the incredible example of how that's all coming together in real life. Uh, so those my are some of the Yes. This is Matt Fox interjecting. You become part of my morning routine being a Concord parent. Um, <laughs> yeah. so I have really seen firsthand and enjoy the energy and enthusiasm with which I now wake up my days with my uh, seven-year-old as you greet everybody in eight or nine different languages and then jump into a, what are you guys having for lunch routine and which virtual place are you going to visit? 
So um, I appreciate what everyone's doing, but you're, you're now part of my day. So I've seen the enthusiasm and energy. And well, I appreciate it. It, gets I the pre kids, it gets the kids fired up to get after their day rather than I'm stuck in the house again. They wait mm -hmm. to hear what fictitious place you guys are going to visit today. So <laughs> it's become a thing. So I thank you. This is well, Julie. We, I'm echoing Matt too because it's come a joke to say, "I wonder if Mr. De Young's going to have lasagna for lunch again." So <laughs> that keeps coming up. So thank it's you. Those connections, right? Those personal mm -hmm. relationships. So absolutely for sure. Well, I, I'm going to move on a little bit more to uh, just a, a little bit about personalization and individual support. And I think I need to up my game. I do a morning <laughs> news broadcast for Countryside every day, but I'm not including what I have for lunch. I've pulled my own kids <laughs> into it. And and yeah, anyway, I guess I, I need to take a page from Mr. DeYoung there. But um, <laughs> one of the things that has has been a, kind of a game changer for us in these uh, last couple of weeks. Uh, we've got everyone in a routine, but now we're also identifying which kids need some additional support, which families are are struggling to make it all happen. Um, and the acknowledgement on our part that everyone is in a different situation and, and is dealing with lots of challenges. Um, we've been able to find ways to connect and provide that individualized support and personalize the the experience uh, for kids. And um, typically um, how that's happening right now is just utilizing our support staff. Um, those folks who are not a classroom teacher are spending a lot of time um, doing individual meets with kids and making sure they're getting their homework done and that sort of thing. So um, yeah, Leah, what else you got there? And I have an, I have probably one of the best um, celebrations or successes is and and it has been said ten times over tonight. But um, just shout outs to our staff. When you think about the phrase above and beyond, every single teacher um, just exemplifies that to the tenth degree. I mean, they have just really jumped into this. Every single one of us is learning new skills that are enhancing our learning experiences um, that are benefiting our students and our staff and learning those new technical skills really allows our teachers and our students to find new creative ways to share, connect, um, the teachers having Google meet, um, PLCs or meetings or any of that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, just want to acknowledge the hard work and, you know, the never ending amount of hours that teachers have really put into distance learning. And I also think that parent support and encouragement has been has been huge. I mean, the parents have been so supportive and so encouraging um, for the teachers. And you know, they have questions and they're working as hard as they can. Um, but just the just the amount of feedback that I get in terms of how appreciative mm -hmm. the parents are of how hard you know the teachers are working has been has been great. And the renewed appreciation for the old traditional bricks and mortar school has definitely gone up. I think uh, for sure, without a doubt. So. Yeah. We also want to name a few challenges that have been more significant than others uh, for us at the elementary and, and in the early learning center. Um, those routines and relationships really uh, caused us to look differently at how everyone was managing this situation. Uh, we needed to, in a way, look into the homes of our kids and um, try to figure out why they weren't engaging or what that experience was like for them. Um, we needed to remember that we might have situations where parents are, are juggling work, their own work, their work of their kids. There might be, you know, illness uh, in the home, just so many different things that we're trying to accommodate. So um, just keeping that in mind has, has been one of those things that we've tried to keep at the forefront, um, just juggling all those schedules. Um, probably the greatest challenge in all this is our teachers are missing their kids and the kids are missing their teachers. Um, and, and we wanna make sure that uh, we, can, we can get everybody back together soon, but do it safely. Um, and then our teachers right now are working so hard with everything, the ability on their part to navigate um, just this up, uptick in their day-to-day -day and what this looks like. Um, you know, they might've been in the building 10 hours a day. Now, now we're looking, all of us are, are you know, doing the 12, 16 hour days. And um, there's gotta be a, um, 
a, a change in that soon, right? I don't know. We'll see. Um, anyway, just some of those challenges that we're seeing. Yep, and that kind of continues on the social and emotional um, learning and the connecting. Just it's it's a a constant opportunity for us to practice finding balance and giving grace to um, our families, our kids, our teammates, ourselves. Um, it's just you know something that um, as principals we we hear from our teaching staff. I'm putting a lot of time in. It's worth it but I'm still trying to find the balance for, for my, my home as well. So working through that challenge. Have, um, this is Erica. Have you got, I'm sure you've done this, but as um, school teams or grade level teams um, brainstormed around that critical work life balance to um, really talk about are there strategies that we as a district can um, employ, whether it's um, are all teachers doing the same lecture and could one teacher do it and all, all the kids could see it? Mm -hmm. are, are there time saving strategies? Um, we're, learning, we're learning as we go. Okay. Uh, a lot of teams are partnering together. We actually have connected our elementary grade levels across the district so right. that they're able to partner somewhat, especially now that we're um, spending more time during the day on content related items. Um, so that is happening. And I think too, it, it comes as we become more comfortable with what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, so we're, we're better able to kind of, we, before we, we didn't really know what we didn't know. Uh, mm -hmm. We were, we were, so busy trying to get everything up and going. And I think now we've got that ability at least somewhat to catch our breath and stand back and say, what can we do to, to uh, lessen the, that load um, by partnering? Can I, if I just want to jump in on that really quickly because, uh, because Steve already told me to be more quick. So uh, just <laughs> we, we are in this position where we're looking at um, where are the benefits for the district that are going to come out of this? And so one of the benefits that we have absolutely seen and did start very early is the collaboration between teacher teams across the district. Um, the, the interest in sharing with each other immediately was uh, one of the most inspiring things. In fact, during that first week, I had received an email from one of our tech pairs, Jason Banks, showing me something that one of the teachers at Countryside, uh, Katie Hamill, had shared with her staff. And it literally brought me to tears at that point because uh, it was exhausting work. And so to see this making that sort of progress, those humane and human connections, and that really is some of the next work that we are looking to continue to do. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, the four plus one model has afforded us that time Every week since we've began this journey, on Friday, grade levels across the district are meeting to share what they're doing. And so uh, I, I just had to jump in because that really has been a highlight and a, a gain that we look forward to continuing going forward. And I would agree with that, Sean. As someone who's uh, led one of the district-wide grade meetings, it has been an incredible experience to watch to give these teachers time to be able to come together across the district the swapping and the sharing of ideas has been incredible and someone will say well i've been doing this and then i hear another teacher from another building say oh i've been doing this and then all of a sudden you have this sort of cross fertilization of all these ideas and it's just really exciting to sit and watch that happen um and then to your point um erica about um, making it manageable. That was the question that I asked. I challenged the fifth grade team with across the district uh, last Friday was, what are you doing to make this a manageable experience? Recognizing that one of the challenges is this sort of home-like work balance and coming to the realization that we cannot recreate a bricks and mortar experience. Mm -hmm. And how can we make, how can we make something as close to that, but not, but recognizing that's not what we're going to get but not overworking ourselves to death. And they did a really good job of, again, talking as a team like, oh, 
this partner on my team is now doing this instead of me. And this partner is doing this now instead of me. So that that collaboration has just been, I mean, a, a big win. I mean, if you're going to get wins out of this, that's been a really big win. Um, it's been a challenge to find that home-like work, work balance, for sure. I mean, that's the challenge for our staff. It's the challenge for our community. Um, and I think especially when elementary, you know, when you talk about going from a dependent learner to an independent learner, you know, so you're starting off in, in E with Leah and you're a very dependent learner. And then you get to the high school where you're a more independent learner. At the elementary level, it really depends so much on that person to person, face to face interaction. And, and it's tiring for teachers, but they are really, whether it be through Google Meets or whatever, they're really jumping in and doing the best that they can to, to make that happen. And I think that's a key message as leaders, that if we can continue to drive home, not just to our teachers, but also to our parents and to our students, I think it's a powerful message that we cannot repli replicate an in-class experience. Um, and if our teachers are trying to do that, it's going to extend their day to that 12 to 18 hours. And if our parents are expecting us to replicate that. It's going to have expectations that are beyond what we could provide. And if students are having that, I think it's going to, everyone's going to have these expectations and it's not fair for anyone because it just, it's a different, it's a different type of learning. Mm -hmm. And if we can mm -hmm. all just be on the same page and expectation that we are delivering a different type of learning, it doesn't mean that it's bad, but it's different. And we need to all be working from the same set of expectations. And I think that if we can all sort of drive that message home, um, I think that everyone will be better off. Definitely. Um, I know we, as elementary folks, we um, have taken a lot of, of the time here tonight, but uh, I do want to share really quickly. Uh, we, we actually included a video of uh, of a student who had uh, had uh, submitted something uh, that says uh, the title is I really miss you and want to come back to school, oh. um, and uh, so when when uh, folks are able to uh, take a look at this online, uh, they'll be able to access that video. But uh, we did have one third grader at Highlands who submitted a uh, poem and I am going to take a couple minutes just to read it because it's delightful and it really speaks to where our kids are trying to make the best of everything. Um, so here it is. Quarantine life. School is out for the summer, except for this year. It is kind of a bummer. We're <laughs> home all day and we really want to play. Social distancing is hard, but you can always write cards. Mom's cooking can sometimes be scary, and I want to eat at Jerry's. Not leaving is not that bad. I am actually kind of glad. Family time is the best, is the rest. That's great. So congratulations to Lauren. She's now published. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. We'll turn it over to our, our middle school and high school friends. Thanks for uh, putting up with us there, gentlemen. Well, I don't know if Randy are taking the leader. We should just jump in. Go, um, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. Chair Allenberg, Superintendent Schultz, members members of the board. Thanks for inviting us to visit with you tonight. Um, uh, one of the things that, at least from the high school perspective, that we try to accomplish is to try as much as possible to have this feel like school for our kids. And so, setting up some structures uh, where you get up every day and start school at nine o'clock. Uh, you have expectations of academics and rigor. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to create um, opportunities for relationships and some flexibility. So um, I can say that um, we have some things up here up on the slide, um, but some things that have been really noticeable to me in distance learning is a significant um, opportunity to connect with families, your family engagement, the ability for us to have our support staff adapt to new roles and make more connections with, uh, with families and students. Um, I think our students have uh, articulated that they have enjoyed the flexibility of the day. I mean, these are high school kids that are now not being run by the bell. Um, they are using a watch and a clock of when I have to show up to my second hour synchronous learning. 
um, when I have to complete my assignments, um, sometimes getting assignments done quickly so they can save more time later in the day. So some of the things that I'm seeing my first year college student doing since he is home um, are some of the things that we're expecting from our high school kids. So great training uh, for all of them. Um, I've always thought that uh, this community is extraordinary because it has extraordinary families, extraordinary students, and extraordinary teachers. But I can say um, the teachers at Edina High School have uh, surpassed uh, my wildest expectations of what they could accomplish in a short amount of time. So I'm very proud of them and I'm proud to be associated with them. So um, you'll see up here on the slide that uh, you know I've been doing some focus groups with kids. It's a group of ninth grade students I met with uh, last Friday. Um, they give me feedback. It's my fourth uh, focus group I've done with students just to get feedback of different age groups and kids about how things are going. I'm actually starting um, coffees with the principal with, with parents again um, in a Google Meet forum. It's uh, very popular, so I have to figure out how I'm going to maybe do do more or a different setting um, to be able to connect with more families. And I've just done some structured focus groups with teachers uh, throughout our three weeks together just to get information about their thoughts about assessment and, and finals and um, attendance-based assignments. But um, it really has been a collaborative process, and there's been a lot of success so far. So I'll turn it over to the middle schools. Well, the middle schools would like to have coffee with you too, Principal Beaton. So. There's no seats available for you, Tim. Okay. <laughs> Disappointing. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for hanging in there. I think resilience and perseverance are two key words that uh, we're seeing success with, with uh, students, with staff, and certainly with families. I, I won't, uh, you know, say the same things that, that the elementary and high school said. I'll just say that those same things are happening. Uh, to be proud to be part of an organization and to be um, gratified to be a colleague uh, in this district, you know, those are understatements. Like Andy and the others shared, uh, teachers are uh, and educators in our system are rising to the challenge. And uh, I think when we take the temperature about um, what our students and families and staff um, dealing with uh, in lots of other places, I think um, we can feel, you know, really wonderful about the things we've been able to deliver and um you know we have some anecdotes there to the left um we're certainly a continuous improvement organization and so this data that's coming in uh, we're making shifts every week uh based on that data um it's it is learning by doing and i, I just haven't in the three systems that i've been a part of i haven't seen um you know the capacity as high as it is here uh, and so i think you know, we all should feel proud about the degree to which we're able to to be able to talk about successes. But, you know, that doesn't mean there aren't challenges. And so I think on the next slide, we'll have a chance to talk about those a little bit. I think some of our underserved kids and families are, are still underserved in the model for any number of reasons. And like we try to personalize the experience for every kid, you know, there's reasons that we're learning that are causing difficulty for some. And so that's a challenge for us is to to continue to do a good job reaching out, supporting and intervening um, when there are barriers to learning. And so we continue to look at ways to um, serve all of our learners. Uh, hats off to the student services team uh, led by Jeff Jorgensen and, and all the educators serving in special education who are doing heroic things uh, to serve kids and yet it still remains a challenge that those needs are profound in many cases and the supports that we have don't directly translate to online support and so uh, and in many cases it's hard for us to learn uh, how to make that translation so again we're working hard to do it another challenge i'd highlight before turning it back to andy is just that you know, how do we manage expectations per the statement by Chair Allenberg and and um, and Miss Bergman around, um, you know, what is appropriate expectation? Uh, you know, it isn't going to be a direct replacement for bricks and mortar school. Uh, and yet we have super high expectations. It's one of the reasons we're great. Um, so managing that remains a challenge. How to appropriately appropriately situate the expectations of staff and families around what can we provide uh, and how well can we provide it. Um, but just hats off to this 
to this uh, community and the staff. Um, they're doing amazing work. Uh, thanks, Tim. If I was just going to add anything else, I mean, I think it's, I'd view this more about growing pains than it is about um, a challenge or something that we can't accomplish. I think we keep learning uh, each week and we see, keep addressing uh, new problems that come up. One of the things I talked about in the work session that we're noticing is that we have some students that that struggled um, at times with school avoidance and, and issues with attendance and, and engagement when they were face-to-face -face that are doing very well in this distance learning environment. And we have some other students that um, might have been doing very well in a face-to-face -face environment that are, are now struggling in, in distance learning. So we're learning a lot from the experience. I think the biggest challenge uh, going forward um, is the endurance that Tim talked about. I think endurance for our staff to be able to um, keep up the pace um, with this and, and look at their time. But one of the things I, one of the best pieces of advice I think a teacher in our building gave is to think of distance learning um, and his eight hour workday is not linear and not consecutive. Um, this is a, a teacher who has young children at home that does some teaching and then takes time to take care of his children, his two young children and play with them and, and do school learning for them. And then he comes back to school and then he puts his kids to bed and then he comes back to school again at eight o'clock at night. So it's just really very interesting about how he's he's thinking about how he divides that day. Who was, but this is a teacher that um, is very flexible and has that framework. Um, it is challenging when we think about families and, and teachers that have uh, young children at home or they're a single parent and so on. I think that's what our work is going forward is to maintain that support for our, our staff. Thank you, everybody, for uh, adding depth and articulating some of the uh, things that we've worked through and some of the things we have yet to work through. I'll try to take the next few slides and kind of wrap up and then see if our uh, board has any questions for this team. Um, in terms of next steps, um, we want to continue to take our learning from this and adapt what we're currently doing, but also really reflect and adapt what we do in the future. And I think there's a great impact that this is going to have on Edina Public Schools moving forward. And we want to we want to realize that we want to capture it out of this experience. It is a, I'll, I'll make one more push to continue to get feedback from families. Please check your uh, emails and, and complete the survey because that helps us. Um, we will continue to work hard to connect with students and families um, to make sure that uh, things are working for them. And uh, we do have to continue to navigate the balance between um, not enough and too much um, for students and for families. And those are just, those are challenges for us to do, you know, as we enter these next steps. Um, in terms of the impact and the learning carrying forward, uh, we do have probably a deeper appreciation of face-to-face -face learning and, and recognizing, as some have mentioned, the, as Mark mentioned, the importance of the brick and mortar learning environment, and what that really truly offers kids. Uh, we also recognize that there's been increased community connections and partnerships, whether it is Ed Fun or Give and Go or businesses in our Dana community, families, um, speakers that have stepped up and have jumped in to help kids or some of our local stores like Jerry's who have been so gracious in supplying materials and supplies for food delivery, etc. Uh, we've had, um, you know, some of the, the impact includes the way in which we do learning and the learning opportunities that will be moving forward and that we'll be able to offer staff will be, um, will be awesome. And then the skills that teachers have developed has, has just been incredible. In a short amount of time, teachers have uh, been on an intensive growth curve here. And probably to some of them, it feels like being a student teacher all over again because uh, we haven't, you know, had this experience before. In terms of a few other impacts, we have, of course, district uh, level work that we try to manage and that work has been impacted because we have pivoted and shifted 100% to trying to launch distance learning. So things like our Edina Learning Curriculum Adoption that um, we were preparing to launch, um, a science curriculum review that was um, in the middle of process and teachers working to pilot items. We've had to pause these items. Um, our course design studies around compacted science and earned honors, uh, pre p language arts, we've had to pause these because we are really waiting to see what kind of direction we get from the governor and the um, 
the commissioner of education with Minnesota to determine what we have to prepare for next. And we'll have to put our resources to that next uh, element of preparation. Uh, we've also been reviewing an assessment management system um, for our district, and we might be able to continue to pick this one up. Um, we have moved phase one of our fine arts curriculum review, and we will be pre presenting that to the board next May as, um, as, as we'll also be um, presenting our alt comp state report in June and meeting that timeline. Those were a couple of projects that we really had pretty much completed before this process um, of shifting to distance learning had started. Some areas of that need additional focus um, or that we'll have to create some feedback loops around um, include just gaining a better understanding of what works inside this model. How do we continue to personalize it? Some of the tools that are working, some of the tools that are not working. Uh, many of the administrators um, talked about the different ends of the spectrum and what that different support needs to look like. Either there's not enough or maybe there is too much. And so just trying to continue to maintain balance and, and looking at grading, looking at assessment, um, and then planning for what this looks like when we come back, whenever we come back, um, how we carry that learning forward. So with that, uh, we thank you so much for this valuable time this evening, and uh, we'll turn it back to the board to see what questions you have for our team. Uh, so before we go jump into that, I just want to add the other two components of the work that we've been charged with. Um, one is the child care. Um, just to let the board and community know, we've been um, providing child care to tier one emergency workers, about 20 to 30 uh, varies, but between 20 and 30 kids um, every day. Um, and then about one to 10 emergency, <coughs> excuse me, tier two workers um, that we serve. There's about one to 10 of those um, every day. We've had a meal count. Uh, we provided 14,675 meals. Um, and uh, We've had, uh, uh, I think uh, Steve mentioned, um, our technology on access has been uh, managed well. We've had uh, 2,000 connections with that, that we've um, assisted uh, families in making connections to the technology. And then internet hotspots, 88 of those. And um, I would be, um, uh, be delinquent if I did not let uh, the community know the wonderful partnership we've had with the Meal Fund and Ed Fund and Give and Go and maybe, um, I know uh, Julie and Eric have been part of that. They can provide some detail behind that, but they have been supportive in providing meals to um, the families, picking up the lunches and breakfasts, providing a third meal, a, um, a dinner at night, which has been uh, really a wonderful partnership in, in this emergency. So with that, Chair Allenberg, I'll turn it back over to you. Yes. Um, yeah, Julie, would you like to give a quick update on the dinner portion that we've been able to um, provide to families with sure. our partnership? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, talk about um, a lot of the discussion tonight is about collaboration, and this is an example of that going on with our different organizations that support the district, um, the Ed Fund, and Give and Go, and, um, and the district staff, um, including transportation, food service, buildings, community ed staff. Um, it's really been a, a joint effort. Um, I mean, just this morning, um, 50, we sent out dinner bags and or dinner boxes to 54 families, um, which accounts for, um, if I'm doing, I didn't do the math yet, but it's a lot of dinner bags and a lot of meals. I mean, we last week hit over 2,400 individual meals just for dinners um, that are, um, that are going out and, and supplementing with produce and Girl Scout cookies that are donated and, um, some supplemental gift cards for families that have extra needs, um, you name it. So it's been, um, it's been remarkable and uh, a huge shout out to the staff that are doing the heavy lifting. Um, as Steve mentioned, the technology went out through transportation, the dinners are going out plus the breakfast and lunches. Um, the operation that um, David White is is orchestrating in that pickup area is something um, is something else. So, a huge shout out to everyone who's been involved and everyone who's donated. It's been an incredible community effort. So, yeah, yeah, we've um, uh, given out over seven thousand dinners to these families, and we realized quickly that 
a, there is quite a transportation barrier for a lot of the families in the district. And so it brought to mind that if transportation is a barrier for breakfast and lunch, it's probably going to be a barrier for dinner and came up with a process. And I think we're one of the only districts, if not the only district where we're providing um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner to these families in a seamless way. Um, so I'm really proud um, to have been part of it and it's just great. So. So Julie, if yeah. people are looking to either volunteer, help out, donate money, where's the best place they should turn? You know, I think the best place to turn is to the Ed Fund. Um, I The Ed Fund and the Meal Fund are running the financial um, fundraising piece of this. And as the, you know, we've been able to raise an incredible amount of money, I don't, um, I don't have a clear assessment of where we're at and how much more we need for meal fund, but I know that there's other, um, there's going to be other needs for the district. So I would go to Ed Fund and 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 ask them where the best where the best place is to donate and what's coming next. Um, and in addition for volunteering, um, I would contact Community Education, our volunteer services, um, which is Karen Rorick oversees that. And I say that because um, there's going to be different needs. Um, there's immediate needs. There's down the road needs. And um, she is our, you know, she's the first stop for any volunteers that want to work with the school um, or work with students or supporting. So um, we're a pretty tight ship in terms of the actual packing. And that is to adhere to social distancing rules um, and efficiency. So we were down to four people today and that seemed to be the magic number. So there's not a lot of room for people to come in, but that doesn't mean we don't need people's help. Um, so I would, I would go to Karen. <laughs> I'm sure she's going to, but I mean that like she, she will help us to um, and help determine where needs are. Um, you know, we have a lot of volunteers in the system already and um, any help is great in a many different areas for the district. So I hope that answers your question, Lenny. Yep. Thank you very much. So um, going back to um, all the updates that Randy and the um, educators, provider and administrators and Steve's team, do the board members have any comments or questions about um, what was provided to us um, from them? I have a quick comment. This is Owen. Um, this is a distance learning is a massive adjustment um, on the part of three main groups, uh, the teachers, the parents and the students. And it's a three part partnership. And um, I very much appreciate that uh, your presentation um, hit all three and um, dealt with it holistically because that's what it, what's happening. It's such a tremendous adjustment, and I think we're we're responding flexibly and um, powerfully. So, at any rate, thank you. Anyone else? I can't oh, see someone. This is Janie. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. I, I also want to echo. Um, my astonishment and my gratitude over what has been done. Um, I'll just give personal anecdotes. It's amazing to see the um, grace and passion and flexibility that teachers are not only showing kids, they're modeling that behavior, which I think is really important right now for our kids to see when adults can do that. Um, and I, I will tell you, I have a high schooler who, um, it's really been amazing to see that um, he is really taking charge of um, his student agency and, and the environment that Andy's staff is providing is, is allowing him to do that. And so I, I am appreciative that he it has the ability to function in, in this environment right now. Um, but I also have a lot of compassion for kids who are struggling right now, um, because I know for a fact that that's not um, every child's experience, because this is different and it's scary. Um, so I just wanna say that, that I appreciate all the efforts that I recognize and I see our district leadership and I see the teachers and I see the parents. Um, and, and I have compassion for all of these groups. And I want to also say, um, you know, we, 
we talk a lot about what our teachers are doing, but I want to say a big thank you to our students um, because I know this is really tough on them. And I don't know if they can recognize this now or if this is going to come with hindsight, but recognizing that they are a part of um, making a difference. Um, you know, them doing this together as a large group, they are a part of making a difference in their community. And so I just want to make sure that I express my gratitude to our students for, for joining in this. So thank you. Thank you, Janie. Anything else? I just have one other, one quick comment. Um, it's outstanding, the work that's been done. Um, it's intentional. Um, and I think that as we, I, I do worry about um, the stamina of this and what our teachers, um, not just for students, but I, I, I think about the teachers a lot in this, right? Two weeks is a lot different than eight weeks. And so um, I just, um, this was echoed in our work session. Ellen said it, um, said it best about what we can do to help. So I just want you to know that as a, as, as a, as a board, like, please keep continuing and talking to us about what we can do to help support. Um, and I think um, tonight was such a great way to stop for a minute and really take stock in all the work and the effort. So um, I applaud you for that. But I, um, I just encourage you, raise your hand, you know, speak up, let John know and what we can do to help, um, help support in any way. So thank you. Hats off to you guys. It's been, it's really incredible work. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, if there are no more comments, um, I just want to thank you guys, reiterate my thanks to you guys. And I just want to point out, I think um, Steve, someone on the um, DMTS team pointed out earlier that what they were doing wouldn't work out if they didn't have a relationship with teaching and learning. And I think that to me, what I've seen is this just illustrates what an important ecosystem a public school system is and what a wonderful ecosystem we have here in Edina Public Schools. And it's not just the people on the screen here, but it's, it's everyone in your team, Steve, if they weren't working hard and if they weren't partnering together, it wouldn't be working. And it's same thing with your team, Randy. And if you guys weren't working together and if you guys weren't working with the principals, and if the principals and the teachers weren't working together and if the parents and the families and students, all it takes is one group not collaborating and this entire thing falls apart. And I just so value all of you and everything you're doing because you're all so important to the system that we have here. And I hope all of you feel that but I hope that you reiterate that to people that aren't always on board meetings and don't always feel that. And they know that they are so important to what we do here. And so please let them know because every one of you make a difference to what we're trying to do. So um, just thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So I hope you guys can get off our, the call unless you really want to stay and can we go get some sleep. Thanks everyone. Oh. <laughs> I can go and uh, thank you. Go and enjoy much. the rest of the night though. I'm sure the rest of the board meeting will be super enjoyable. So <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye, -bye. Bye. Um, what do we have next? I've lost uh, we are, so we're starting discussion. We are up mission, for discussion. And vision, mission and vision statement. It's a discussion portion of the night. So the first part of the discussion is the mission and vision for the strategic plan. And we just discussed this at our work session on Thursday night. Um, and we have an edited version um, that um, Julie had uh, brought some, ed some edits to our work session on Thursday. So that is what is being presented here tonight. And tonight is just an opportunity to discuss this version before it goes for approval next month. And so I don't know if anyone has questions or comments about what is here tonight being presented. Um, one of the thing, one of the follow-up items from that discussion last Thursday was to charge um, 
in the notes was to, I was charged with um, re um, looking at that word, providing academic excellence um, and changing that up, which um, I, I, I did. Um, so if you look at this mission and vision, um, that how it is, my suggestion would be instead of having the word um, meaningful future by providing academic excellence, I would change it to by bringing together academic excellence and then scratch the and, and then you, you would have bringing together academic excellence, knowledge, skills, and inspiration to realize their full potential. Julie, you cut out. Yeah. Um, can you read? Oh, sorry, Julie. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I, I, I just, I was able to, I'll start over again. So um, looking at, pull, um, at replacing that word providing mm -hmm. academic excellence. So what I am proposing um, based on that is to switch it to say, this is the full mission statement. Edina Public Schools is a dynamic learning community that prepares all students for a meaningful future by bringing together academic excellence, comma, knowledge, comma, skills, and inspiration to realize their full potential, period. And then the second sentence is the same and the vision is the same as what we discussed on Thursday. So I switched out providing with bringing together. I'm going to voice that I like that change. I like the, to me, I, I do like the way that that speaks to also what our staff bring to the picture. So I, I like that better than providing. Can you read it one more time, Julie? Sure. Edina Public Schools is a dynamic learning community that prepares all students for a meaningful future by bringing together academic excellence, comma, knowledge, comma, skills and inspiration to realize their full potential. replacing that word provides, I mean, it's important because we do do more than provide. So create, coming up with a word on what we're doing more than providing, which I, I totally agree with. So, um, yep. So that's, what's, that's my option out there right now. Why do we have knowledge in there? What if we took knowledge out? I would, I would echo that that would be a great <laughs> Could because couldn't that just if we say by providing academic excellence, skills and inspiration, full potential? I would agree with that. Yes, I'd go with that by providing academic excellence and the skills. By, uh, by academic providing excellence, and skills, and skills and inspiration. And inspiration. Yeah, I would put the in front of inspiration then, because I think we're trying to force fit. No, the whole issue is knowledge. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. I know I would agree. I mean, I think when, when I was moving our words around, it's to not be repetitive and academic excellence is. I know they're know. different, but even when you say bringing, you st still sort of have that issue with knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so no, I think that's a great, I think that's a great suggestion. Do you want me to read it without knowledge in there? Yeah. And then Janie, did you want me to put the in front of inspiration? I think so. Okay, Edina, I'll just read it. Edina okay. Public Schools is a dynamic learning community that prepares all students for a meaningful future by bringing together academic excellence, skills and the inspiration to realize their full potential. Sounds good. Academic excellence, skills and... Mm -hmm. I can support that. I can too. I think that's a, I think those are both two good tweaks there. Okay. Well, I, I'll just give you my two cents if that's okay right here. Go for it. I actually, um, 
I feel a mission statement should be short and memorable, and this one has um, developed into a longer one. Um, uh, I, I don't think that our mission is to bring together something, um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure that out. Um, uh, um, and I'm, I'm just it, it, listening to this right now. So by bringing together, that's not the, um, that's not what we're doing for the students. So I'm a little bit, I'm not really on board with that. Um, I'm uncomfortable with using the word dynamic in such a prominent place. I'm not sure if that's the key adjective for the district. Um, and I, I just feel that prior versions of the mission and vision um, that were shared with the community um, better fit my aspirations, so. Discussion, okay. Yeah. So is the one you just read, Julie, did you say providing or bring together? Bring together. I changed it based on the feedback from Thursday that um, Ellen had mentioned about that we don't we aren't providing academic excellence. It had read providing the academic excellence, and so that's why I, I looked at it well, and worked on trying to come up with a different way. Which and I agree with that. Um, so this was based on Thursday's feedback, right? And I and this I was isn't, this this isn't this has not been changed. Just so we're clear, this has not been changed from the mission and vision that was approved at our board meeting in right. February. Yeah. So well, the language is the language is similar. The dynamic learning community, that's all there. That's all the same. Um, it's just re reworked so that it isn't repetitive so that our there's a difference between our mission and our vision in terms of what we're what we're communicating. So all I'm suggesting yeah. is actually leaving and providing I personally would leave in providing. I would take out the phrase and the knowledge and then put in the inspiration. But that's the only thing I would do. So then we would, so you want it to say for a meaningful future by providing academic excellence, skills, and inspiration. Skills and the knowledge, yes. Not the knowledge. No knowledge. Sorry. Providing academic excellence, skills, and the inspiration to provide their to realize their full potential. Okay. Yeah. Even though the next sentence starts with "we provide," I mean, I know that we've talked about that, so you're okay with that. Yes. Okay. Because all we need to do is get this. We need to get this um, right. approved. Yeah, I, I I agree 100%. I just know this will go on every piece of this will go everywhere. And so I want to make sure that I know it's wordsmithing at this point, but I, I, I think that if everyone else is okay with having provide in there twice, I think we I think we do do more than that. Um, so but I'm willing to not I'm more than willing to say that that's what if that works, then let's let's move ahead and put in provide. But I don't know what everyone else thinks. What does everyone else think? I'm fine with the modifications offered. <laughs> Matt, Lenny. Why can't one of them be deliver? What was the? What's the pushback on deliver? The first one. Do you think the first one should say by bringing together academic excellence, comma skills and the inspiration, or say provide by providing? And the issue of providing is. I think they providing. In the second one, use the word deliver. We deliver opportunities and activities, or we offer opportunities and activities. Just pick, pick a second word. For semantic reasons, I'd love to not have provide be in both of them, but I'm. it's definitely not gonna 
be a major sticking point for me, but I'd prefer it to have two different words there. So why can't, yeah, so Janie, why can't we use deliver or offer as the second one to get this to completion? We, we could, I mean, I just switched it. I, I'll i read it with, I'm gonna read it with the providing and the offer in the second paragraph, what you just suggested, Matt, okay? okay. Yep. Dyna Public Schools is a dynamic learning community that prepares all students for a meaningful future by providing academic excellence, skills, and the inspiration to realize their full potential. We offer academics, opportunities, and activities that encourage creativity, foster curiosity, and develop critical thinking and problem-solving skills. We support every student's educational journey by creating a caring and inclusive school culture that supports the whole student. But aren't, aren't we taking out academics in the second paragraph? Because the, the version I'm looking at right now from board book does not, it, the second paragraph is we provide opportunities and activities that encourage creativity, foster curiosity. Right. right. Oh, I'm looking at the, I could not, I copied and pasted it. Okay. Yeah, that's my bad. I would change it from offer. It was a PDF. Deliver. What was that? Yeah. I like deliver, how Matt said, we deliver opportunities. Oh, see, I like offer. <laughs> it's okay, I prefer provide. <laughs> Can we put I, that on a dartboard and... The way I look at it is we we offer the opportunities and the activities, right? And and to me that feels like it speaks to choice. That's why I like that word. Deliver feels um, less about choice to me. I'm fine with either. So offer? Who wants to provide, who wants to provide in the first sentence and offer in the second sentence? That's I mean. That works. Lenny's okay with it. Who else? I'm good. Janie is. I'm fine with it. I am I'm fine, fine with it. I would kill the word skills in the first sentence. Because we don't provide skills. And we have skills in the second one. <laughs> we're, we're, if we're, 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 we're providing, we're providing academic excellence and the inspiration to realize their full potential. We're talking about, we offer activities that encourage and develop skills. So, which is part of, right? I mean, I'm, you're right. We're not providing, I mean, I would say, providing academic excellence and the inspiration to realize their full potential. And then we offer opportunities and activities that encourage creativity, foster curiosity, and develop critical thinking and problem solving skills. I think that's a clean version. So if we stick with providing and offer, because. Yeah. I, well, I'm, I'm just thinking we offer other types of skills besides problem solving skills. And I'm yeah, I I'm, think that's why it's up in that first. That's why it's up in the upper right. part. And I ask, actually, I'm not sure that we actually provide inspiration. I mean, that's I'm not sure if inspiration is something that's provided. It's the same. It was the same with my comment about I don't think you can provide knowledge. I'm not sure you can provide inspiration. You can foster inspiration, but I think I'm sorry. Shouldn't have said that out loud. <laughs> that's I mean, and that's my concept, right, Janie? That you're thinking along the same lines. That, uh, you know, it we you. Um, it, that is something that a, a, a successful school system should do is um, foster inspiration. So, so then for me, that goes back to Julie's first edit of bringing together and not providing. But bringing together also doesn't mean, doesn't say what we're really doing for the student. Can I 
make a suggestion? Yep, please. Okay. I'm going to read this, what I think, if we, because it's easier than explaining it. I'm going to, I think we move, well, let me, let me just read it. Edina Public Schools is a dynamic learning community that prepares all students for a meaningful future to realize their full potential. By providing academic excellence and inspiration, we offer opportunities and activities that encourage blah, 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 blah to the end. So I think fostering, fostering fits better in that context. In the first sentence, Matt? Nope. Where you said provide. Oh. I think if we're gonna keep if we're gonna edit this anymore, we're gonna have to take it offline. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I I was just following what we had discussed and, and voted on on Thursday. <laughs> so Okay. Well, what do you want me to do? What I'm on direction here. Do you want me to so, clean it up based on what we just talked about? I'm that, not particularly. I'm not particularly fond of that last uh, iteration where you merge par sentence one or paragraph one and paragraph two. Okay. But so, Erica, we have a work session on the thirtieth. Yeah. Which, which would be the final one prior to action on in May. Yeah. Okay. All right. Why? Um, can and can I just mention one more thing? If since we're really looking at it again. I. Yeah. Sure. The beginning. The the beginning of the vision. Our vision is for. Maybe we want to just take that out and just say each and every student will discover their possibilities and thrive. The, the beginning is kind of just clunky. I agree. I would remove the first four words, but let's do that. I, I would agree with that. Let's do that on the 30th, but I totally agree with that. All right, let's take this back offline. But just for your notes, Julie, if you're the one carrying the paper, I agree with Ellen just to say for each and every student to discover their possibilities and thrive as a solid vision statement. And um, I don't necessarily have clear direction about the mission, but we'll figure out something. <laughs> so I think we have to figure out if. Well, I think it's impossible to, I mean, it's hard to look at us to we're wordsmithing. So right. are we changing? And then it, you end up changing the meaning by doing more wordsmithing. So that's why, I mean, I would not have left provide in because we don't provide skills. So I changed it so that we could include that because I was trying not to, I was trying to respect the language that was in there that we already approved back in February. So right. I, I can for the work session come with two versions that are very similar to what we talked about. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, um, and include that vision change that Matt and Ellen just made. And Julia, that, what if you? Uh, I'd really like us to think again. If if can you read your first paragraph with um, taking out providing and taking out knowledge, and then in the second paragraph put offer and read that to us. And then I want everybody to think if that will work. And include skills at the top? Yes. Okay. For now, yes. Edina Public Schools is a dynamic learning community that prepares all students for a meaningful future by providing academic excellence, skills, and the inspiration to realize their full potential. We offer opportunities and activities that encourage creativity, foster curiosity, and develop critical thinking and problem-solving skills. We support every student's educational journey by creating a caring and inclusive school culture that supports the whole student. So my vote would be to take out skills in the first paragraph, and that's exactly what you said, but taking out skills in the first paragraph. Can anybody else get behind that tonight? I could. I could. I could. Erica, Lenny. 
Helen. There's something disjointed about providing academic excellence and the inspiration to reach, to realize their full potential. It's just that there's, there's something that doesn't flow to me in terms of maybe grammatically. I know it's that their full potential is supposed to relate back to all students, but it just seems like there's a hitch there somewhere. I'm fine if that's like edited to be like a version that we then take a look at to bring to the 30th. Okay. I agree with, I agree with uh, Lenny. I feel like there's something just, it seems to be like academic excellence and inspiration. Like there's some, something. I, I agree. I, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but, but I think that we need to move on to the, Okay. I'm good moving on. Okay. So if you could if you could take that and then the change Ellen suggested for the vision and then um but you and I could talk offline about what we could do for the 30th. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Thank you. Um let's see, next is the um and structure the HR committee to broaden its scope to be more in line um, with how we're currently operating um, and the hopes they'll help us streamline how we operate as a board. Um, and um, and that will will not have to create as many ad hoc committees. So um, that's that's what this is. So if there are any comments about this, Lenny or um, Janie, did you want to add any, excuse me, add anything to this? I did not want to add anything. We've covered this. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't need to add anything else. I feel like we discussed it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, and I just have two comments. Uh, one, yes. I agree that the name change makes sense to me, but I'd like to make a motion to refer this to the policy to committee to just change Section 3A, number 4, on policy 213, to include the words, um, what are you changing this to? I'm sorry, to include the words governance committee, whatever you want it. Government, yeah. to change human resources yeah. to governance committee. That's what I yeah. would, I would make a motion that we refer this to the policy committee to review and change policy 213 so that our governance documents reflect this change and bring it back to the board at our next meeting. So the purpose of this essentially is to change 213 to from HR to governance. I don't think we need to refer to the policy committee. I think that the, the intent of this is to actually make that change we can simply include the policy the next time through. What are, but that's what I'm proposing. I'm proposing that it comes back to us at the same time that this is going to come back to us. We're a govern. I mean, we are. A, we got. We're governed by our policies, so this just acknowledges the, the fact that um, even though we might pass this at our next meeting, it, it, it wouldn't be part of the, um, the policy 213 takes precedence over it. I, I know Ellen, it's are just things it's out just, of protocol. Yeah, so I'm just saying we don't need to refer to the policy committee, we can simply bring a revised version of that policy with the different verbiage, because in essence, this is changing that policy. Right. I don't know what the uh, normally the all changes to policy have to go through policy committee. So I'm just going through with a normal protocol. And the policy committee is meeting right before our next meeting, right? So I think we just don't need a motion because this is what we're planning on doing. This is the discussion anyway. So, so and why, this is Owen. Why don't we just take it up and we'll at least look at it and um, very likely pass it 
we'll, we'll find out and then we'll bring it back. Just bring it, that's what I'm saying. I'd like it brought back at the same time. And I think we're all in agreement with that, right? I, I mean, okay. I don't know why. I, I'm not, I, I think it's a fine idea to change the, the title and, and that's fine. I'm just trying to knit it all together. Um, I have one other, one other comment and it has to do with the responsibilities of the full committee. And it's unlike other committees in that it states broad board related district level communications audit and recommendations. And um, it is unusual for our committees to do, um, for board members to do audits um, and conduct them instead of managing um, and analyzing audits done by the district. So I'm just, I'd like to talk about that and what your thinking is with respect to that, that aspect. I, I don't understand your question. Well, normally the board does not conduct its audit, an audit of operations. So what we're, so that's the, but that's what this is, is calling broad board related district level communications audit. So normally um, we would review an audit done by the district. This isn't like a formal audit. This is like if the board wants to come uh, communication series of um, emails that this is the committee that would review the communications that as a board we have we had come up with this isn't like a formal auditing process but when whenever the board writes communications it always goes through the HR committee and we review them and edit them. And so we're already working in that capacity right now. And so it's auditing and editing and reviewing board communications. Well, okay. And what I'm, I'm just responding to the fact that most of other committees are um, acting uh, more with oversight, right? I guess I, I guess I'm confused because this th these are not district communications; these are board communications so, that we're producing. So it's called audit. What Erica is describing is oversight of communications of our own board communications. So um, I, I, I guess that it, it, does, it didn't make, it wasn't clear to me. That's why I'm asking about it. So I would suggest the following, which is that we did plan uh, on taking a look at committee descriptions and bringing those before the board. So this was to give a general idea to the board and we can take that particular suggestion and perhaps when we put together a, a full description of the committee that would then get approved as part of the, the, the committee's mission, we'll use a different word than audit and okay. we'll be a little bit more descriptive. Okay, great, thank you. Audit's very descriptive. Are there any um, other questions about this? Nope. Okay. Um, next, we have two policies up for discussion. Um, i review them, and then I know John was going to talk about policy 439. Erica, is this my turn to jump in? Yeah, just to give an overview of what we are, what we're doing. Okay, uh, we've got two policies up for review here. I have a few other policy comments to make um, afterwards. 
530 is uh, the immunization requirement. We have Mary Heinemann attend the board meeting. Um, she was the initiator and um, the um, the secret the uh, nurse of EPS e EHS and she suggested and we did expand the language for the immunization requirement to include uh, pre-K and that is in 3A and then in 5B we altered the language of notice of exceptions and this is um, for families that choose not to immunize and uh, it is simply a change of the font size and the font style so as not to single out these families. This is an MSBA model language recommendation. We had a few other MSBA model recommendation languages too, which would consolidate language and um, uh, bring it in compliance with the state statutes. So um, that's in effect what it is. And John, Erica, Julie, did you have any further comments to offer about it? No, these are just all, um, like you said, Owen, all recommendations from our um, our, our nurse and MSBA, so. Yeah, no I recommend we pass it. You did a good job explaining it, I think, yep. and, where, and where the changes came from. Yep. Okay, so we have that, and then we have 439, which actually appeared uh, oh, is this the time to ask questions about uh, 530? Sure. Okay. Um, or recommendations? Yes, um, this is the discussion. Okay. So um, in 530, I would recommend changing um, item 4A, uh, where it reads, uh, the parent or guardian of a minor student or an eman uh, emancipated student submits a signed medical statement. Um, I would change that to the parent or guardian of a minor student or an emancipated student submits a medical statement signed by a physician. I'd, I would change it to state that it's signed by a physician, affirming. And that brings it in compliance with state statute 121A15 that requires that um, the exemption for the medical reasons needs to be signed by a physician. With that level of substantive change, I think we might need to bring it back to the board for substantiation. Um, and I'm fine with doing that. Well, um, we're going to have to check because Mary, who's the health associate, is the one that recommended that change. And and it's changed. I mean, it looks like what's going, Ellen, what, what, what Ellen is recommending, if I'm reading this correctly, is the change that, that she had crossed out to change right. from what we're changing to. So... Well, I'm looking, you can look up state statute 121A15. So I'm just bringing that in. I, I'm just making ours in alignment to the state statute. Um, right. This is just up for discussion. So it's going to be, you'll be bringing it back. But if you wanted to, to double check on that, that would be fine. Um, I, um, well, all, all we're saying is that the head health associate with the district made that change based on Department of Health. Um, recommendation. That's correct. So, but why would we not want our policy in alignment with the state statute? That's where. Well. On this no, one, I, I took it on her authority that she was in compliance with state statute. Right. Well, and so, so now look going it up, back and double up. checking. Um, so. Triple checking. But anyway, so that's, that's one thing. And, th and then I have, a, um, so I, I'd like you to double check on that um, because um, it matters. And then the, the other, I have a question um, and I was just gonna ask you guys uh, what, in the, in the event of a, an outbreak of a communicable disease, does the district have a plan for the protection of students who've not been immunized, whether for medical or conscientious reasons and such students would be significantly elevated at a significantly elevated risk of con contracting that communicable disease. And some institutions require that unvaccinated or completely vaccinated, incompletely vaccinated students stay home during a recognized outbreak. 
And I um, just wonder, do we and can we do this in order to pe protect those students? I wonder if we ought to have Mary and Trevor speak to that. Um, Ellen, would we, or uh, Erica, do we want to bring the two of them back to our next policy meeting and review this with us so that we get the language exact? I think, I don't think we need to bring them to the meeting. I think that we can ask Mary um, and double check with Mary and make sure that that's the most up-to-date language. Um, as far as Ellen, your question about having a communicable disease policy, I think that if you want to bring that to a work session and the board wants to bring that to a work session, we can prioritize that with all our other priorities, but I don't think that that's a topic to talk about right now. It, it, it's actually just, it would be, um, well, I'm not sure if it would be an appendix to this. But that sounds like a plan the district would have to come up with. That I don't know. Maybe the district has one. That's why I'm just asking. I don't know. I, I really don't know enough about this, but in the middle of this pandemic, I'm thinking about these types of things. We recently, and, what do we, uh, remind me, we had a policy on communicable diseases that we that did. That was just removed. It was yeah. just removed actually from policy because it's so out of date. Right. So why don't, um, I don't know, I guess I would like to um, find out if, if we happen to have that and if the district has a mechanism for keeping track of, of which students would be at the highest risk, risk if they're not vaccinated, if there is an outbreak so that we can protect them. So there's, I mean, other, other organizations are dealing with this type of thing and I'm... Um, for communicable, so the communicable, communicable disease policy, we as a board voted to remove it from policy. Correct. Because it's so out of date. That's correct. And that was just done maybe two months ago. Correct. So I think that if you have a list of questions that you want to ask to some administrators that you should come up with your list of questions and that as a board, if we want to prioritize administrator time, that we can do that. I think is the best way to handle it. Okay. I'm, I'm bringing it up now. I understand that we can move on. I, I'm understanding where you're coming from um, and um, I, I'm bringing it up because this is, it's an, immuse, it's an immunization policy and it's making me think of um, the students that are not vaccinated and whether um, they have appropriate protections and that's all in the case of an outbreak. That's all. I'm just raising the question. That's all. And so, yes, I'll do that. I'll, I'll move forward with that. Okay. You, so then you'll move forward with that. No, I, and just, then I thought, I mean, if we, if there, students need to have immunizations to attend public schools, right? Isn't that our policy? No, it, this policy, there's two exceptions as it's stated in this policy. Okay. So I, I hate to go back to what you covered earlier, but where is the contradiction in this policy with the statute? I just... If you could just repeat what you had said about it, you don't need to explain it. Needs it needs to be signed by a physician. Which sub part are you talking about? The um, the part that requires um, 4A. It's 4A. Exemptions. It's 4A from, that was replaced with what our nurse, um, our director of nursing said was um, to date with the Minnesota Department of Health. Okay. And I believe they broadened this policy to allow other caregivers to... Um, like a physician's assistant right. or nurse practitioner. Yes, they just, it wasn't just physicians. The Department of Health gave more um, more flexibility for other caregivers to get the information. I remember that being part of the discussion. Well, I'm just bringing this up. You can double check and then get back. This is just for discussion. So it's going to come back to us next month. What, 
I'm looking at the state statute 121A.15, and it A1 says a statement from a physician or public clinic which provides immunization stating the person has received immunization. Um, and so when language is included, such as a public clinic, that seems to imply a broadening of the provider and which would permit um, a physician's assistant to my reading of this language, which would mean the amended language would contain that and then would be compliant. Uh, would my understanding and my reading of this here be acceptable to you, Ellen? I'm 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 looking. I I just looked up the state statute. I was going to just say this is up for discussion. I can send this to you, um, and we can move on on our agenda. So you'll have to send it to John, not Owen. Okay, I'll send it to John. Okay. So we you want me to you want me to consult with Mary and Trevor? Just not Trevor. Not Trevor. No. Just Mary. Just ask Mary. Just say. Just double check to make sure that is okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so then we'll move on past five thirty, and are we ready to move on to four thirty nine? Yep. So policy four thirty nine was um, revised to um, to uh, govern coaches that may be. Uh, seeing kids in private in a private business or a private practice related to their coaching so um, that a student's activity with that company the company or the activity or whatever that that individual may be doing um, that their participation in their activity isn't tied to the um, participation in Edina athletics so it just separates that um, separates that and then provides uh, some communication required communication to the coaches about that and who, John did we speak about this in a policy meeting I'm just trying to remember yes we did um, and I believe uh, Julie, you were part of that. Troy was part of it. And I think yes. and then Trevor provided some language, uh, provided Section G, I believe. Yeah. Trevor wrote all that. Yeah. Okay. Right. And it was, I mean, my understanding, and I thought it was a very thorough addition um, to that we added in just to give more clarification um, that coaches outside can can provide off-season coaching, but also stating um, and being completely transparent about um, about what they do for the schools. Isn't that, that's the spirit of this, correct? That's John? correct. That's absolutely correct. Yep. So I, th I thought it covered off on the concerns that we've received. And so I felt very comfortable with it. And that was the discussion as our committee with Troy. That seemed to be, that was a consensus among the three of us when we spoke about it. Julie, did you guys speak at all? I think when I was trying to look at this from all angles um, and covering everybody's bases, is was there talk about coaches using their um, Edina credentials in marketing off-season um, services? Just thinking that if we're... Um, I'm just kind of looking at it from both sides. So not, not um, offering off-season coaching and at the same time not soliciting off-season coaching with the use of their current position, which might not make any sense, but been here for a few hours. So <laughs> No, I mean, my, my, yeah, my recollection, we did talk about – whether or not it was um, any kind of coaching or activities were being promoted as, as a Edina public right. schools um, entity, but then being able to use their credentials and list it as that that's their experience. Okay. We did not talk about it because I don't know any coach that does work outside that wouldn't use that. I mean, I, right. okay. No. 
And I know that um, that Troy had was going to look into a couple specifics on different things that um, wanting to make sure that we were adhering that we're adhering to it. Okay. But there was okay. no. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so then we'll move uh, 439 for action next month. And we'll take 530 and we'll bring it back to committee. And Mary will attend that meeting. No, and we're going to move 530 to action. We're just going to ask a question to get Mary to verify that change. I don't think okay. there's any reason it has to go back to committee. All right. Okay, good. Um, a few more comments I have to make yep. is um, we were going to be talking about policy 713 transportation, but we are going to be putting that into a work session. Erica will be scheduling that at some point. Uh, we told Ellen, as I'm recalling, that we would speak about policy 104 for a little bit in our policy meeting, and we did. And we um, effectively came to the conclusion that it has been discussed. Um, it, uh, complaints are, many complaints are dealt with in other policies such as bullying, sexual harassment, and this policy 104 uh, fills in some of the cracks. We are concerned that the um, removing of the complaint in the appendix would make it uh, the uh, voicing of a concern or a complaint to the administration by a student, which this covers, would be a little bit less inhibiting, thus a student would be more inclined to offer some kind of concern. And the, the term concern was used rather than a complaint because many times students approach teachers or administrators and they're not sure if they're complaining or not. They just want, they're searching for what the experience was that they had, that they had some concern, and sometimes these do morph into complaints. Uh, so that was much of the rationale. Uh, the uh, complaint policy, uh, the appendix hadn't been used very much at all. So that mm -hmm. I just wanted to offer that information. We also did um, say that we would talk about policy 218 briefly, which we had passed at the last month's board meeting. And um, we wanted to briefly take a look at this in the context of existing policies regarding board governance 23, 205, 206, and 208, and we found it compliant. Um, further, we wanted to um, not dive into it in depth because we were thinking that we need to get farther along through the pandemic to get some perspective on 218, whether it's working or not and what we can do to calibrate it and tune it to better um, accommodate to the needs of a given pandemic. So we made that commitment, we did talk about it, and I wanted to express what we had said. So with that in mind, I'm done talking about uh, the policy considerations. Great. Thank you, Owen. Um, next, we're going to move on to legislative um, legislative advocacy during the pandemic. And um, John, did you want to yep. present this? So, um, question came up on the, um, the kind of what, what we're thinking about with regards to legislative advocacy at this point. I think um, I would um, not. There's a lot still remains a lot unknown uh, regarding the. Um, uh, legislation or legislature, what the legislature is going to do, it's unknown with budget. Um, you heard tonight from staff, they're still listening to some MDE policy, which may go to rule, which may go to law. Um, we're, uh, we're, we really, there's the many, many unknowns um, that to really uh, figure out what to lobby for. But I think there is one thing uh, to, to lobby for is the uh, um, uh, at this point in time to really show our support uh, to our district hourly employee costs. Uh, last Thursday um, in your work session, you uh, essentially furloughed community ed. And I think it's good at this point to continue to um, uh, lobby for that because it's legislative. John, especially John, yeah, this is not real quick. So we just to clarify, did we furlough or did we 
uh, remove salaries to zero. Remove we well, remove their time to zero. So, but right. furlough means that they would could be called back once we get going again. Right, but it wasn't technically a, for, yeah, but it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, I I, I used the fur, word furlough loosely, okay. but you're right. We went down to zero. Um, so I think it would be the, the best uh, the, the best thing to do at this time would be to lobby for district hourly employee costs. Other school districts are doing the same, so that would be my recommendation. Great. Thank you, John. So this is just an opportunity as a board to um, weigh in on um, whether or not uh, we would like the LAC to advocate in response to the financial concerns raised by the pandemic and um, what we would like them to advocate for. So I'll turn it over to the LAC and the rest of the board. Um, so just, I, I, I want to let you know that this is not coming from the LAC, so I have questions about it myself. Um, this is generated by um, board leadership and John, so I don't, um, I want to make sure I understand what you're um, asking the LAC to advocate for. Um, and and so, and I um, I wish I could see you, John, I can't. So I'm kind of looking at my screen going, okay, well, you're not there. Um, is this, are you thinking that this is um, HF4415? Is that what you're thinking about? Yes, I think it, I think that, that that's, that's part of that. So, um, because at the legislature, the, the hourly wage, all of those bills are, are all of that is in the HH uh, 4415, but it that's, that is a lot more than just hourly wage. So I just want to try to figure out what you're suggesting that we do. I, I'm suggesting that at, at this time, I think for, is to, um, to lobby for and advocate for our hourly employee costs, as I think is what we should be we should be advocating for. And what and so from what that from what I'm I'm hearing, we've we as a board have are no longer being um, paying for those costs. So it would be the cost that we accrued um, from March through now. Is that is that what the I'm, I just want to understand what it is that we will be um, advocating more clearly for. I think that's I think that's a piece of it. I think it's um, and then and, and continuing to move forward as this continues to unfold. If the um, if the child care begins to grow, um, do, do we need to have um, um, more money for those hourly employees? Um, I think it's just preparing for what we know now. I think that so, is the most. So what you're suggesting, so um, right now, are we getting reimbursed for the hourly wages from um, the, I, I thought the state was going to give us money for uh, providing child care for tier one. They are not. They're not. So. Um, that's going to that's coming currently coming out of our 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 community ed fund is that fund four correct and um and you'd like us to speak to th that piece of 4415 that that would be my recommendation yes and um, and not speak to any of the other. I mean, this bill is going through. Um, you you want us to just ignore the rest of it? I, I don't understand why. I mean, in the pat in the you had written a letter saying that you wanted us to endorse forty four fifteen, and I'm just trying to figure this out. I, it would it would be easier for us to advocate for for so the, a the, bill that's being that's. So there's the, the there's the challenge of this, Ellen, is that um, to put the so it, it, we're trying to balance the work John and I are doing within the district with what you're suggesting we we advocate. So um, we don't know there are.
there's information coming out from the from uh, the federal government, and I'm not absolutely sure, and John's not absolutely sure what we should lobby for. So there are some um, specific uh, provisions that the state's going to have to uh, the state's going to have to interpret what the federal government's going to do with their dollars. Some of those dollars might some of those dollars might be used for some of the things we talked about in the previous letter. It's just that there's so much information right now that's changing. And then to add another layer to provide the LAC with additional data and information is challenging. It's challenging for me to do that because of the, the, the amount of, 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 of attention and leadership we have to give to the system. So I think it's safer to make the recommendation to um, lobby for the district hourly employee costs. That's fairly direct. We have some community ed dollars information that I think is more accurate and more secure than some of the other things that we had listed. John, this is Janie. So this doesn't preclude us from later on adding things to- Oh, absolutely um, not. In fact, I so think- this is what you feel like is the, the, the highest priority and what- At this time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there is going to be some huge needs coming out of the right. legislature, but we don't know what those are. Right. Okay. So for now, th that's your recommendation. Correct. Right. And this is, um, so this is Julie talking. So just so um, I want to make sure that I'm understanding this too, is this, your, this recommendation, John, it's based on what we're hearing and what you're hearing and what we heard as an LAC from the representatives, our representatives and our kind of information gathering conversations we've had. Correct. Where they are talking about what is the immediate need right in front of us because things are changing so quickly. Correct. Um, and it also helps us align with AMSD's recommendation on how we make sure that the mandate from Governor Walls is actually funded. Correct? Correct. In this child care. That's space. correct. Okay. I just want to make sure. I mean, I'm in. I'm yep. in support of that. Keeping a very tight focus um, based on what our legislators told us would be an effective way to communicate as a district and to advocate for us. Um, but so that's not a question. That was just my thought on this. So okay. I am in support of that, and then what that looks like. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks for being clear on what the priority is. So, um, and can I um, just make sure that I understand from the board? Um, that you would like the LAC to advocate for um, for COVID relief. Is that, that's what I'm hearing, right? That you would like, I haven't heard anybody say you don't want us to do that. Um, and I just want to understand your expectations going forward because um, as John says, things are moving very quickly. And as a board, would you do you need to hear from us at every step and at what step? I mean, I'm just wondering, right now you're saying um, you've determined, leadership and John has determined that this is the one thing that they would like us to do. I'm actually thinking it's a very low ball figure considering the, the fact that we are only taking care of 35 or, you know, very few um, tier one students. Um, but um, so I'm just, that's fine, we'll do that. And our next time that we get together in two weeks, um, we can report on our activities, but then what? I mean, what do we, do we, do, are you as a board wanting to get involved in setting the priorities? I, I am, could I jump in? Could I yeah. jump in with a comment? Yeah. Um, this is such a fast moving target. It shifts by, by the week, by the day. And it may be that there are other priorities that emerge too. And I'm a little concerned that we'll be advocating, um, directing the LAC to advocate for hourly employees when the situation may dynamically change in three weeks. And um, and I don't know about the viability of it too. And the priority, is it gonna pass? And do our legislators have bigger fish to fry? And those who are inclined to support that in the legislature 
already may be of inclination to do that. Um, and I'm just a little concerned that there's a lot of money going out and I'm also, that's a concern of mine also. So um, checks are coming from the federal government. So it, I, I just have a certain level of caution uh, about um, advocating for something that might be so dynamic and um, it may be just short lived too. It's true, true. I want to jump in here and answer Ellen's question, which is, so when the when I voted in the uh, to approve the LAC platform, we did not have a COVID nineteen pandemic, and certainly I never intended that my vote was going to broaden to whatever the committee thought made sense in the pandemic. And so to answer your question, I think that the committee will need some guidance from administration and the board in any response that pertains to the pandemic. So I think that answers your question from my perspective. Right. And, and, and so, and, what I'm just trying to do, because everybody's acknowledging things are moving quickly, um, I'm just wondering if a simple uh, additional platform plank that would say that the the board would um, approve any um, or support any efforts to recoup losses from uh, the pandemic. So this so would be, be a financial Something, something so that we would be able to um, move quickly in the case of uh, financial um, uh, legislation coming through. So I would say that the consequences of the pandemic and the best response to the pandemic are unknown at this time and may vary from week to week. And so, no, I'm not comfortable with that platform being added. It also doesn't answer the issue we have, which is our administrator time. And so, I mean, the financial cost of the pandemic could be from A to Z. And if the Legislative Action Committee is dependent upon John Schultz and John Tope getting information to the Legislative Action Committee for a broad spectrum, that's just not tenable. And so, the point is to have a narrow focus that works with the system we're in right now, the priority has to be our students and getting the students what they need on a day-to-day -day basis. That has to be the priority of John, it has to be the priority of John Tope and having the financial vi viability of our district. So I'm of the mindset that if if things pop up that John Tope or John Schultz say, it'd be great if we could have people advocate for this, that could be fed to the Legislative Action Committee uh, that they have time for. Like, I see this, here's the information and pass it along. I don't see a great reverse process just given the nature of the situation that we're in right now. I, I echo that. I think that that direct line is going to be essential for one. We can't we can't predict out. Um, Owen, you made the comment like you know things may change in three weeks, and I that's right. I think they are going to change in three weeks, right? We go into that as the expectation, as we heard from the legislators in our discussion with them. So I think if we're able to take listen to the priorities of the district. And as they come one by one, and maybe it's not a, you know, we can look at as a legislative legislative action committee, you know, we handle each priority differently with how we advocate for that too. Maybe it is a letter just from the board. Maybe it's just our committee calling and writing. writing. Maybe it's when we engage the entire community to say, this is where we're going. But I think, um, I think we have to handle every priority that comes in slightly differently too, um, so that we're really targeted and effective um, without trying to figure out and keep going back to the back to the well and saying what what Erica, that's exactly right. Like our students have to come first, and I want I want our administration focused on that, um, and so that we're actually supportive and not pulling resources to do this work. 
So I'm 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 in a I am in favor of this priority, but it has to be under the guise that it's going to be this priority and that we adhere to a an effort that matches this priority. So that's so where I fall on this. So I think we need to decide as a board if people are comfortable, first of all, with what John put forth from an advocacy perspective, which would be the child um, care workers. And then second, with a process that is more driven by what John and um, John Tope identify as um, needs in our district. And then also with like what Owen said, it's, I mean, things are just changing rapidly. So even if we agree tonight that it's the child care, I, honestly, John could wake up tomorrow and something could be completely changed and we have to be nimble and. Right, so, and, so my, my question would be, is the board comfortable if John, I mean, John has been at our, our LAC meetings, just to, so that I set the record straight, if you ever thought that we were not following John's direction on this, he was at the meetings um, when we set the priorities originally, and he set the priorities. So we're not, it's not as if we, he, he told us one thing and we didn't do it. So, um, but I'm just wondering if, if you would be okay if John tells the LAC that we would he would like us to advocate for something, would this need to go back to the board? Like, does this need to be an agenda item? Um, or would you be comfortable with John directing um, the LAC in between meetings? Because our next meeting is in two weeks. So, and we meet haphazardly throughout the rest of the legislative session. So I'm just wondering if that what I'm hearing is we need flexibility and we need to hear from John. Um, if you're okay with him giving us direction and us following his direction and copying you or something, would that be fine? Or should we just work on, on one thing and then we'll have another agenda item to d discuss it, um, John can come to the LAC and tell us what his um, objectives are, and we'll present it to the board. Or what? What is the process? Hi, I'm. Um, this is Julie. I mean, I I think one of the things, one of the sentiments from this whole the meeting that we've had the last I don't know feels like nine days, but it's really probably been like five hours. Is how do we how do we best help our district? And so I look at this as this is the directive from from our from John right now this is the priority and unless something else bubbles up this is what we focus on and so then if something the next thing that comes then we look at when that what that timing in timing is and I think it absolutely needs to go for a board discussion whether that's at a work session a special meeting a um an official board meeting so that there is that checkpoint with the with the board I think it's too important and too um this is just too important not to have board engagement if John adds another priority on. And that's my take on it. But I think we need that checkpoint because if not, then we're kind of going back and forth saying, what do you have more priorities? Do you not? I think we have to trust and say, okay, this is what we're going to work on. And then if there's something else that comes up, we got to, he'll let us know that that's going to happen. Um, but I, I would ask John, does that sound like the right plan so that we're effective with your time and and yes I think, that, I think i think that makes perfect sense okay so so how did we're i'm sorry what are we going to end up doing so here's how i think this is if i just go back to 2008 when we had the um the uh, um those were those were also times where there was a lot of unknowns and um, and it was hard to figure out okay how do we how do we work with our legislature so I'm just going to base this on that experience I think we just have to wait to see what comes up I, I can't I, I won't be able to go to the LAC next week um, and say these are the these are the priorities for the next three months I, that's just impossible um, 
unless something has is, is, has been um, decided at the state level that we would need to lobby. I don't know what that. I don't. I don't. Don't. I really don't know how this is all going to unfold. I can predict that there's going to be the need for advocacy. I just don't know when, and I don't know uh, for what and how we do it. So, um, so I, I think we just need to really remain nimble in this um, because if we start planning for something, we I think uh, Owen said it well. If we start planning for something, we don't know what direction it's going to go. We're going to be wasting time and um, energy um, trying to lobby something we didn't need to lobby for. So. You know, that's, the I can, that's the best I can best I can put forward. And then nimble, essentially, would be to the extent that you saw an opportunity, you would bring it to the board, which would then direct it to LAC. That's correct. I think I would bring it to the board uh, to say, okay, this is what's in front of us. Um, I think we should do A, B, and C. And there might be some things we have to do internally to our own fiscal or programmatic. Um, uh, rules or policy uh, related to whatever change the state's trying to make. And at the same time, then ask for the uh, advocacy from the LAC. Is the board uh, comfortable with that? I am. Yes. 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 A question I have is, uh, it, it's sort of an opinion, but kind of a question too. And that is, I think of the LAC as being very significant for broad strokes and um, for you know short uh, short order issues, I don't know if they're if the legislators are waiting on bated breath to hear from the LAC. I think when they need quick information, they're going to reach out to key players in the district, such as John, uh, such as maybe Ellen, maybe just to get a pulse. Because when things are moving so fast, you can't just assemble a committee and get a vote. Uh, you take you you do your own informal nose counts, and I think that that's how a lot of legislators operate in a crisis. So I'm a little concerned that if we're going to put a lot of effort into the LAC, it may not be the best use of our time because of uh, the expediency with which uh, the decision makers at the legislature have to make the decision. Um, so I guess my my inclination would be to I think the LAC is significant, but I'm just a little concerned how valuable is it right now? And could we spend our time in other ways that might be a little bit more productive? Yeah, I agree with Owen. It's not a, it, what Owen's saying is it's not a value statement, it's a focus and direction statement. So in a time of crisis, when the, the you know people in the legislature are fielding 5,000 calls a day, they wanna know what is the CEO of the district going to do or not do? They don't wanna speak to an ancillary committee. They just don't, just based on volume right now. And the LAC was set up to, in my opinion, be an advocacy group around all needs for children. And as Owen said, it's not a acute, you know, crisis vehicle that has autonomy. So I think it's to take direction from the board and, and the district. So um, I guess we can. Um, I'm comfortable with the direction that John, if you have something that comes up yep. that you feel like the could benefit from yep. legislative action committee that you'll inform the board. Yep. Yep. Is that the direction that everyone, am I consistent with what everyone also feels? I just want to make sure I'm articulating. I'm comfortable with that. I think a number it's of them are yes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said, Lenny. I said a number of us have already said yes. Okay, I just yes. wanted to make sure I didn't. Yeah, yes. that, no, that's exactly what I had heard before, and I okay. understand it. Okay, okay. Then I think we can move on. And I just wanted to um, thank and also apologize to those that have been waiting for the action items. Um, we have John Tope and Eric Hamilton here for field turf. Um, so can I have a motion to approve the Edina High School turf replacement? So moved. To approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay, is John still here? Yes, I am. Oh, thank you, John. 
Eric is here too, right? And Eric. Yes, I'm here Thank too. Thank you guys. Yes, uh, so Chair Allenberg, Superintendent Schultz, and members of the board, this is the uh, second uh, installment here. As you uh, mentioned, Chair Allenberg, we approved the preparation, field preparation at last week's meeting. Uh, now we took bids for the actual turf. Uh, those bids are in, and our turf uh, consultant, Anderson Johnson, is recommending that the board approves the bid from Field Turf USA. I think we had a number of board questions uh, last week, um, predominantly uh, answered by uh, Director of Buildings and Grounds, uh, Eric Hamilton. But I just want to make mention for the public that this turf, uh, we've, we've exceeded the useful life of this turf. We've gotten way more out of it than we had originally planned or that the, the state plans for us to get out of it in terms of years of use. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Eric to just go over anything else he might have to add, and then we'll take questions from the board. Eric? Yeah, this is, uh, again, we disc discussed this uh, quite a bit. Last week, we talked about the work that was going to be taking place. This is the second portion of that, and that this is the turf portion. So it's the green side up uh, portion of this. Uh, we've worked with field turf in the past. Um, it's the same material that we use at all our turf sites um, from the, the classic turf itself to the infill. Um, we worked with ac uh, the activities department, uh, Troy Stein, his coaches to get the, all the markings and every, all the um, trappings that would be within the turf itself. Uh, aligned with the sports that we're going to be using. And we'll get um, actually, I think, two more reviews of that and all all players will sign off. So unless people have questions, um, like I said, this is the second time we've kind of talked about this. This is Matt. I, uh, as the treasurer, I reviewed this. I think that this is um, clear process. We know we're replacing artificial turf with artificial turf. And I support moving forward and voting to get this done. Um, I'd just like to make a comment. I know, um, so this turf predates my time on the board. Um, and I don't think it is um, a secret that I'm not a fan of the crumb rubber infill used on the turf. Um, I, I would like to just ask if as a board, we could find time to have a discussion um, about best practices when using this uh, material. I, I know I, I've done a lot of research um, in years past about it, and I think there are some safety precautions that are part of the responsibility that, that we have to our students who have activities on those fields that I don't see happening. And um, I think that we owe it to our students if we are going to make this much of a sizable investment. I think we owe it to um, the community, to our students, our athletes, um, to really kind of revisit that. So I'd ask Erica if that is something that you could put into the parking lot yep. um, that we could could talk about. Are you talking about like the GMAX testing and such? No, I'm talking. There are or some. There are some best practices. So um, kids are supposed to be emptying their shoes when they get off the field. Oh, They're okay. supposed to be washing their hands. Oh, it's things, it. yeah, that that we don't do on a regular basis. Um, okay. And I, and I know that because of the amount of crumb rubber that comes into my okay. home and then into my eating areas and stuff. So I just like us to revisit it. It's been a while since we've had that discussion, and and I'm just requesting that we revisit it. Okay, I have that written down. Thank you. Great. And I echo what, what um, Janie's sentiment there. I think, um, you know, in part of our um, consent agenda, we talk about the Minnesota Green Corps that we're signing for waste reduction and um, which is incredible. But there's also, you know, land and land use in there. And I would love for us to if we one day talk are able to talk about this. Um, not one day, but when we're able to talk and have that conversation about um, the safety piece of using this, um, that that would be a goal that we could work towards. Um, so that, I would just add that to the discussion down the road. Okay. So, Thank you. 
And I'm um, always driven to make decisions as quickly as possible, and I'm inclined to just vote for it tonight. The other element that is strong with me is I like to hear from the community, and this was a very large issue. I don't know what, four, five, six years ago, and it may be simply worth our uh, service to the community to air it in a work session um, for half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever, just so that we uh, conscientiously do review it. So, Janie, to that point, I could I could be supportive of getting our eyeballs back on it again. Ellen, did you have a question? Yeah, I just um, I just have a com a question for Eric. Um, how many of these turf fields do we have? The, the straight answer is um, we have two at the high school. Um, if you look at size, though, um, that lower level is um, probably more than three football fields. This is one football field size uh, on the upper west side of the high school. We also have the Coleman Stadium and um, the upper turf at ECC, which is, again, probably two football field size. <laughs> Okay, because um, I was really surprised at how expensive this whole project w is. Um, at, yeah, this um, one at nearly a million dollars um, with a lifespan of eight to ten years, and um, so I'm just I'm I'm looking at the number of turf fields, and I am wondering. I mean, we must have a plan. This is a question. We must have a plan um, to replace all of these turf fields in our budget? So um, a couple answers. The first answer is yes, uh, we'll have a long-term plan and that'll be part of my um, long-term facility maintenance plan that I, I present every year. Um, the turf itself has lasted over 15 years, so I'm not sure where eight to 10 came from. It's it's really has outlasted its long-term life. And we're doing some corrections that uh, I'm not sure I understand why they installed um, originally. So they put um, crushed rock around the outside of the, the turf. And I, for the life of me, I don't understand why, because that rock gets pushed onto the turf, which creates more of a hazard. So we're, we're spending a little bit more money to solve some issues that have been um, plaguing the site for a little while. One is the crushed rock and two is um, uh, handicap accessibility to the field. So we're going to do a little bit more than we um, normally do as far as a replacement. It's going to be an improvement and a replacement at the same time. Okay, and um, and I have a question. It seems like there's another option for the type of turf, and um, it looks like a nominal cost, but I'm, it looks like a, a premium upgrade or something. Would that give us additional years of life or substantially reduce injuries to users? No, um, definitely not on the user the the uh, the user side. We do GMAX testing every year, so we make sure that the fields meet our the, the recommended GMAX GMAX range, and that's done by a third party entity. Uh, this is just their option to upsell us a little bit. We don't need the upsell in this case, and uh, what we're proposing is matches the other sites is. And that's exactly what we want. We want to match what we have. We know how to maintain it. We've got the, the, the material to and equipment to maintain it. The staff knows this product. Um, there's no reason to spend more than than what we're, we're uh, proposing. Right. And this one is really highly used, isn't it? This is like one of our, our highest used fields. Yeah, you know, all of our fields gets used a lot. Um, this one's uh, close to a lot of parking, which makes it a little bit handier. Yes, and the middle school uses it because it's convenient. Okay, so I would agree with my fellow board members that we need to look at the as um, as we talk about what is our financial future. Um, I think that while I will be approving this, um, I, I do think that we need to revisit um, the the cost of these fields. Okay. Any other comments from anyone? Okay. 
Um, we'll now vote by roll call to approve the Edina High School turf replacement. Allenberg? Aye. Box? Aye. Green? Aye. Jones? Aye. Michelson? Aye. Shaw? Nay. Wallen Treatment? Aye. Um, the Edina High School turf replacement is approved. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, next up for action is class size memo. Do I have a motion to approve the class size memo? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. And I'll do this. Um, so the uh, at the last work session, we presented the um, class size memo uh, along with the explanation of how class sizes are managed. Um, so this is a annual uh, memo that is approved just to 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 guide our class size. Uh, um guidelines or to guide us in developing our class sizes i'll say it that way i'm tired okay thank you uh, do board members have questions or comments on the class size memo i have one observation we bring this up it, we need to bring it up every year and um while I'm in favor of voting for it, I would like to stir interest in having a Farmington-like survey where we pit um, class size reduction against personalized learning, against um, reading and math enhancements, um, GT, because we hear so much about class size and there's a very strong contingent of the community that would very much like to have our class size reduced. It becomes a quasi religious issue in some circles. And um, I hear teachers would like it reduced. And um, I've been, I've read things on my own about it that some people question that uh, if you have excellent, if teachers have adequate training, it will work. There's examples of Singapore and California when they increase class size, there's uh, some connection that the quality went down. So uh, because of the vast insertion of all new teachers. Um, and so there's this ongoing issue. Ever since I've been on the board, there's been concern about it. And um, I, for me, it's fundamentally a community decision. It's their money, it's their students. How do you want this? And that's what I find appealing about the Farmington study that we heard of last week, um, because we can put it in front of our voters, in front of our parents. What do you really want? And um, then I think that that will go a long ways to alleviating a great deal of the concern we have in the community that, that comes up again and again. So I would be in favor of doing something like that the next time we bring out Morris Leatherman or, or if we're able to informally commission it ourselves. Uh, but it's clearly one of these themes that just is a constant uh, within our school district, within many school districts. Yep. Great. Thank you, Owen. So by the way, before we go down that survey road, I think that we would have to have an understanding of what surveys we're interested in and where that one ranks in the priority. That's all. Um, and I, I have a couple of comments. But, okay. Um, as I brought up at the work session, so this is some of these I, concepts aren't new, but um, uh, there's some some things that I'd like to see incorporated into these guidelines, and I'd like to just bring them up again to the board and hope that they might get some traction. Because I think that class size matters. And I think that teachers and parents and students think so too. I think that it, it's not just the size, but the composition of the class that matters. Classes that have a higher challenge index should have either a different target class size or the support that they need. I don't think that this guideline equitably accounts for the different challenges in a classroom. And I'd like to see a guideline that accounts for challenges as some districts do. It's clear our administrators believe that kindergarten classes need additional paras, 
Um, and I believe we should put additional para support into our budget. Actually, I think we need to review kindergarten class sizes and consider lowering their class size max. Along with this, I think we need to insist that all classes over max target get the para support slated stated in this guideline. And I also believe that we should set as a district measure of success that Edina's class sizes are close to the metro-wide median in all grades, but most importantly, K-3. But I believe that Edina should resume reporting to the state our class sizes, as we used to do, and our neighboring districts continue to do. I'd like to make a motion to the board at a future meeting to resume reporting to the Minnesota State Annual Class Size Study. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Um, we'll now vote by roll call to approve the class size memo. Allenberg? Aye. Fox? Aye. Green? Aye. Jones? Nay. Michelson? Aye. Shaw? Aye. Wallen Friedman? Aye. The class size memo is approved. Um, so the only thing we have left are um, some reports for information and then any announcements. Or liaison. Oh, I apologize. Do we have any um, committee announcements? No. Um, John, do you have any announcements to make? No. Um, the only announcement I have to make before we adjourn is that um, I just wanted to thank um, Zach Horn, who I think might still be on the meeting, but um, he's been um, instrumental in getting our virtual meetings online, and he's done it seamlessly for us, and I wanted to thank him because we wouldn't be able to have our meetings if he was not here, and I know that he does many things behind the scenes for us from a systems perspective, and he's just been a huge asset to our district since he came on board, so I really... Um, really appreciate him. And along the lines of gratitude, what I'd like to leave 